and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily for Thursday afternoon. Great to have you with us and uh, lots to get to today coming out of last night's Stanley Cup final broadcast. Uh, of course, we will talk about the game, the bizarre ending, the controversy surrounding the Avalanche's OT winner by Nazem Kadri. But I think for most people around these parts, what was the uh, most noteworthy point of the entire broadcast was Elliot Friedman talking about Pierre-Luc Dubois at the first intermission. We're going to get to all of that coming up. Cannot wait to chop up uh, a lot of big NHL topics, including everything that happened last night with the one and only Steve Coolius. Cooley will join us later on in the program. We'll also welcome back Brandon Rewicki. Get, a, get an update on his trip to the Wisconsin Dells, see how the mini golf went and uh, the rest of the uh, the festivities. And of course, talk to him about uh, everything going on around the Winnipeg Jets, as well as the National Hockey League and more. And as promised yesterday, had an incredible time with our good friend Matt Leibel at the Rady Dinner interviewing Emmett Smith a couple nights ago. And Matt will join us coming up in about 20 minutes on the program. Been a minute since we've had the rabbi on the program, so we'll be looking forward to getting him on today. Uh, so, packed show. I'm going to dive right into the Jets news. First things first, though, want to thank all the sponsors that make Winnipeg Sports Talk happen each and every day, including our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, F Apparel, Wallace & Wallace, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Breezy Bend, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick & Nicky DQ Group, a Cinnaboy Downs Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course, Cool Bet Canada. Let's get Michael Remus in here and get this show on the road. Remo, gorgeous day outside. What's going on? How are you doing? Yeah, it's great. I'm in shorts, feeling good. However, it's hard to feel good with this uh, tire, for, not, with this uh, Jets news we've had over the last 24 hours. I completely forgot that they need a new coach. Uh, what was it? Blake <laughs> Wheeler? On, that's old news. Who cares about Trot's watch now? Dubois. <laughs> Dubois watch. We're going to have two years of this. Uh, is he going to sign? Is he not? Um, Blake Wheeler, number three on the trade list. I was about to say, does any other Jet want to not be here? <laughs> does any, who's getting in line in line next? Uh, well, but, uh, but yeah, gr great day. Great day outside. Almost, <laughs> almost a little too hot, though. Classic overreaction. That is a classic Jets fan overreaction. We did hear a lot of that on social media from uh, from yesterday who's next? coming out. Goldberg. And listen, we're going to... We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> We're going to play the clips in a minute and we will discuss it. Hey, one thing I do want to mention, though, uh, gang, uh, tomorrow is the show where we're doing it live at Little Brown Jug. So one o'clock tomorrow, we'll fire up Winnipeg Sports Talk from Little Brown Jug on William Avenue. All are welcome to pop by. We'll do the show, of course, and then probably hang around for a pint or two and uh, be a nice little transition into pre-gaming for that big bomber game tomorrow against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And we will have a pair of tickets to give away to somebody in our live audience tomorrow. Uh, I think we probably will grab, raid the tickle trunk a little bit and try and do a few other giveaways. So I uh, would love to see you in person if you want to come down and join us. That's tomorrow, Little Brown Jug on William Avenue. Um, so yeah, Remo, we'll get to the game in a minute. I mean, there are lots to talk about coming out of the game. But, um, you know, yesterday, the big, uh, well, first of all, people were, talking about Paul Maurice being hired and we <laughs> there's some vintage Maurice today folks if you're missing some of his press conferences he got together some of his best material ready for the fans of South Florida today so we'll have that for you coming up in just a few minutes but um yesterday the big topic was Blake Wheeler and the potential of maybe a move out of Winnipeg for the Winnipeg Jets captain and last night it was the future of Pierre-Luc Dubois, of course, a restricted free agent, two years remaining of team control. 
and a real priority to try to keep in the mix long term. First up, first clip, we'll talk about the captain. Elliot Friedman did touch on the Wheeler situation and uh, trade talks around the Winnipeg Jets captain. There were reports today, Frank Saravelli reporting that Blake Wheeler is also on the trade block, and I believe that's true. I think the Wheeler thing, though, might be more of a mutual thing. I just wonder if both Wheeler and the Jets kind of think it's time and they're willing to work together should that be necessary to find something there. I think that's that's possible. So uh, the interesting thing out of that is that this is not just the Winnipeg Jets trying to move their captain. Um, it does sound, and Reem, I don't know about you, I, I can't say that I'm surprised. I think the last couple of years especially have really taken a toll on Blake. Um, you know, we've seen his demeanor at times being, um, you know, and Ken talked about it yesterday. I think there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of baggage on Blake Wheeler's shoulders. And, you know, coming out of the disappointment of last season, some introspection and, you know, some realization that with a couple of years left on his contract uh, and where the team is right now, that maybe a change of scenery would be good for both parties. And I guess from a Jets perspective, that report is positive news because as we well, no, Blake Wheeler's got a full no move until the 1st of July and a very limited no trade clause uh, beyond the 1st of July. He's certainly not going to go to somewhere where he doesn't want to go. Um, but I do gather, I guess, my deduction from what Elliot just said that, you know, there might be five teams technically on the list, but if the captain is also willing to you know, maybe work with the team to find a new home for him, maybe that number of teams is actually larger and the chances of the Winnipeg Jets making some sort of a move um, are greater. That being said, I still do wonder with that contract and the age of Blake Wheeler, despite how productive he is and everything that he's done for the Winnipeg Jets, what the return would be. And I mean, listen, Blake Wheeler's been a big part of everything the Winnipeg Jets have done for a long time. I mean, you know, some people will maybe think differently, but you know, if Blake Wheeler is moved and there's not a big return coming back, yes, there are players that can step up and maybe play in that spot in the lineup, um, but the bottom six was weak last year. And at this point, there hasn't been someone knocking on the door maybe to to move into that role as well. So um, big decisions for Kevin Sheveldayoff and add this one to the long list of uh, things on the to-do list and to potentially figure out the future of Winnipeg Jets captain Blake Wheeler. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. It's hard to imagine a team has without Blake Wheeler. He's been here since 2011 when the team moved. He's been Day a captain. One. He's been an elite scorer. Uh, I, you know, when he signed that long contract, you, you kind of thought the end years would be expensive, but you didn't think there'd be a mutual discussion of it being best to move on. But I think that's kind of where the team is right now. And you heard Wheeler at the end of the season. Feels like we're back at square one. And hear Kyle Connor say never too late to start building culture in the final week of the season. Um, it's kind of it's kind of sad. I know just how the team has gone, you know, a bit further and further down the standings since peaking in 2018. And maybe it is best for the team, you know, if he were to move on and he's got some say where it goes. I don't know what kind of return you would get, but I think the team is kind of just looking to rebuild that culture or you know, rebuild the culture or, you know, just start, turn a new page and have well, someone listen, else as, as the leader. So yeah, maybe it's, it's again, I met right reference Calgary, how they traded away or sorry, they exposed Giordano in the expansion draft with your left on his deal. I do see it's something kind of similar like that. Yeah, no, I I'm with, well, listen, Calgary. And I know this it, it, very well, just because of how much time I spent on uh, sports at 960 with Steinberg last year doing shows in and around that time. I mean, that was a really difficult decision for the Flames. And they did not want Mark Giordano to leave. Um, but he did. A number of players stepped up into that role of leadership for the club. And I think that's something we've talked about for a long time. I mean, it is sort of crazy for us to be having these questions, th these conversations today. When you think about the Winnipeg Jets for the last how many years, which has been Paul Maurice, then Blake Wheeler and Mark Shifley, and then everybody else. And right now you got Maurice doing an introductory press conference in South Florida reports that the Jets and Blake Wheeler might be open to moving on and Mark Shifley completely in limbo. And to some people, that's probably a good thing. And many people, myself included, thought that in some ways this needed to happen. But for it all to be happening at the same time, 
uh, you know, can give people some stress when you think about the way this team might look. But all of that was in the shadows of this next generation of Winnipeg Jets. Now, the team's done a great job of inking Kyle Connor to a long-term deal. Nikolai Ehlers is, uh, you know, in the middle of a long-term deal as well. The hope was that Pierre-Luc Dubois would be the next guy to sign a long-term deal with the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, at the end of the season, Pierre-Luc Dubois was asked about this and was very non-committal as to where things would be in a year or in two years when he would have to make that decision. And I think anyone would understand the advantage of a player going to unrestricted free agency and having the opportunity to pick where he's going to play for the majority of his career. And it's absolutely within his right. Uh, I think, you know, if you've looked at the situation, I mean, and it's no different than maybe any other team in the league, when you've got a top young player like this, and you've got a certain limited amount of years, it is the onus is on the franchise to convince the player that this is a great home for him and that, you know, he'll be compensated fairly. And this will be, you know, the spot for him going forward. I would have to say that this is probably the worst time we're possible to be talking to Pierre-Luc Dubois about any sort of long-term extension, considering what we know about last season. Incredibly disappointing. Tons of turmoil within the team. A locker room that was by many accounts somewhat broken and you know a, a very unhappy group of players coming out of the season um i don't think anyone would blame someone for maybe taking their time as opposed to committing to that for eight years now uh let's hear the clip from elliot Friedman. we'll talk a little bit more but uh, i know this got a lot of tongues wagging and maybe some jaws drop from winnipeg jet fans that you know thought this might be easy to get done here's elliot 32 thoughts on pierre luc dubois and the winnipeg jets and the thing with Dubois, he's got two years to unrestricted free agency. I believe he plans to test it, and that's what he informed them in two years. Mm -hmm. I think the Jets are still hopeful that they can change his mind, and that is their plan. I don't want to put a handicap on it one way or the other, because one thing I've learned is two years is a long time. And to predict what's going to happen in two years is foolish. The other thing I know is this is that Kevin Sheveldayoff hung on to Jacob Truba when there were a lot of rumors about what Truba wanted to do, and he hung on to him until he absolutely had to trade him. I don't believe there's a trade request here from Dubois. I don't think he did that. I think he just said he's going to leave it open for a couple of years. But it'll be interesting to see if Sheveldayoff tries to show that there's reason to stay or he decides to make a move. He's been really patient. And like I said, the reaction I got, which is that the Jets hope Dubois will be a Jet for a long time, that says to me that at least they're considering the possibility of, can we make this work in a way that makes them happy? So there was uh, Elliot's report kind of expanding on what he had last night on HNIC and the Stanley Cup final broadcast on the 32 Thoughts podcast. And listen, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and as a number of commenters have already mentioned, I mean, the thought of, him saying, oh, I'm 100% in, give me an eight-year deal, not even knowing who the next head coach is and how the team is going to look, I think is really unrealistic. So this is no surprise. Um, the onus is going to be on the Winnipeg Jets to, you know, make this situation for Pierre-Luc Dubois much better, to make the situation with the hockey team better, to make the team more competitive, and frankly, to make these guys enjoy being Winnipeg Jets more than I think most of them did last season. And I think a big part of that is internal. It has nothing to do with the city. I don't think it has anything to do with the fan base. I don't think it has anything to do with the weather. I think it has everything to do with what happened with this club, how fractured they looked at times last year, and the big, big job over the course of this offseason to get things together, to really put together a team that is cohesive as opposed to a divided locker room and being a part of it. So, listen, Dubois is going to have every opportunity to make himself a lot of money He'll be leaned on this season, regardless of what his contract looks like, if it's a one-year deal, if it's a two-year deal, and the onus will be on the Winnipeg Jets to get this done. Um, you know, unlike Mark Shifley, though, I mean, the Shifley's got one more year of the deal, and, you know, you can't sign an extension. There's, talks won't even be able to officially start until July 1st of next season. There would be the possibility that, you know, Dubois could sign right now. We obviously know that from all reports, there's, we're not looking at some long-term deal this year. So it makes next season, Reem, 
absolutely in so many ways make or break for the club because I think that if they know that there's a possibility that in two years they'll be without Mark Shifley and without Pierre Luc Dubois, um, you know that's a that's a crazy change in, in the middle of maybe the most important position on the ice outside of goaltender. Oh, and by the way, Connor Hellebuck has two years left on his deal. So this next year, who the head coach is, how the team can bounce back. Uh, I think it's setting up for the most pivotal and interesting offseason we've had since this team came back here. And a year coming up, dude, that, you know, could go many different ways, as could this roster. Um, I think everyone would love to see the team get back to being really competitive and, you know, hopefully fill a few holes and, you know, be a team that is in the playoffs and playing at this time of the year next year. If it doesn't go that way, though, um, as Elliot said, and you don't believe that you're going to be able to sign these guys, we could be talking about some more very, very significant trades over the course of the next little while. Because the one thing that you can't do is lose these guys for nothing. They traded Patrick freaking Line to get Pierre-Luc Dubois. I said at the time, if they weren't able to get Dubois at some point signed to a long-term deal, it would be an abject fail for the organization. I still sort of believe that. However... Shevelyev's done it before, and if he is forced into a corner and has to trade him, finding the right deal at the right time will be imperative. But uh, holy smokes. I mean, as you said, the head coaching thing is almost on the back burner right now, although it really is the first thing that needs to happen with everything else that's happened around this club and these yeah. reports in the last few days. Okay, I got an idea. Someone suggested this in chat, Hus. How about we offer Pierre Luc Dubois free beer for life? <laughs> oh wait no. sorry we already we already no, did no, that no. one that was last I'm already week. working i'm already working on it okay already talking okay. to the people at home depot yeah we're gonna be we we know plt's a big big home <laughs> depot guy so uh listen when we need to put the mariano rivera hat and come out of the bullpen yeah. with the well, uh, with the final offer it will have something to do with uh a large home depot gift card and uh maybe some other services we can do for the uh, home improvements that the Dubois seem to love doing reportedly. In all seriousness, uh, my reaction to the, I mean, disappointing to hear that he doesn't want to, or that he's told them that he wants to go to UFA. But if you're a player, I can see why he's 23 years old because he came into the league as a 19 year old. He can get to UFA, you know, a bit sooner than maybe someone who came in at, at 21 where usually you're, you know, still you're cut kind of on the start of the downside of the career. So he could get a big payday. The salary cap is going to be going up in two years, so you'd be able to get more money. And, of course, the state of the team, why would you want to – they don't even have a coach right now. Why would you commit long-term when you really don't know what you're getting into? But I do agree with Elliot what he said that, look, two years is a long time. Big time. If they, if they can come in and have a good season this year and you know make him an offer – that he thinks is fair in terms of what is paid. Because I think part of the issue with Columbus was, you know, they kind of, Columbus likes to play a bit hardball with contracts, and he want, was looking to get big payday. So if he plays well and they offer him what he's worth, I think when you have like an $80 million contract in front of you for long term, that's really hard to turn down. So as you agree, this year is definitely huge. Can, you know, the expectations that Calgary set last year going from, you know, miserable season, below expectations to winning the division. I don't know if the Jets can pull that off. I think they'd have to get back into the playoffs. That would be a success. They're going to need Dubois. I'm going to need Chafley. Someone suggested in our YouTube comments, shout out to the comments, that, you know, could they trade Dubois and Chafley in the same offseason? I don't, I don't think you could do that. That's, that's too much too much turnover. Well, but listen, is, is it could that happen. It, it could happen. And, and, you know, Jeff Merrick had an interesting comment from their interview with Kevin Sheveldayoff at the Combine. You know, he said that, you know, he was talking a lot about Cole Perfetti and Billy Haina really focusing on the young players in this team. And, you know, with assets like that, there will, there could be and will be a time at some point, and I'm not saying this is this year or next year, that, you know, we see a bit of a recalibration of the roster where the team does go young. The team already has two first round selections this year. There's plenty of other possibilities that could happen where, you know, you're getting some, you know, better prospects or potentially trading players like that for, you know, more blue chip players on potentially on ELCs, which again sort of moves the clock ahead. Um, but what does that do for you in the short term? I really do believe it's important for this team. I know there's lots of people say blow it up, blow it up. I 
listen, I don't think there's any appetite right now within True North Sports and Entertainment to do that. I think they believe, and I believe, that there's too much talent on this team to, you know, put a nuke in the dressing room and completely blow it up and turn it over. But at the same time, the pressure is definitely going to be on to improve the atmosphere around the team, to improve the performance of the team. Um, and I think that 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 in itself will improve the feeling in and around the fan base. And I think that makes them, it puts them in a much better situation to sign players long term. Guys, last year was miserable. It was a disappointment. They still don't have a new head coach. There's been no answers to any of the questions coming out of the end of the season. So does anyone think that things would have changed and all of a sudden, you know, a player like Dubois with as much leverage as he had would just be signing up? Yeah, give me a contract. I'm signing it for eight years. No. So I try not to overreact. Listen, would you like to hear different news? Absolutely. But we need to live in reality right now. And considering the season the Jets had last year, there's a lot of work to be done. And that work is going to be done. We're going to begin the first day of training camp under the new head coach. I know damn well Mark Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to be a big, big part of this team. And if he can have some great success continuing to play with Kyle Connor, if the team can win, if the team can be competitive, if there's a bright future going forward, if there's a better atmosphere around the club, you'll have a hell of a lot better chance to have a player like Dubois consider staying here long term. Right now, that ain't happening. I'm not surprised. I don't want to overreact to it. And, uh, you know, again, it's just something that we'll be talking about throughout this offseason. Uh, but if I'm Dubois, I'm not even considering jumping on anything long term until I see where this team is going. Essentially, what Mark Scheifele said at the end of last year, which many of us took as sort of strange for a guy that was the leader of the team and was signed for two years, it's legit coming from Pierre Luc Dubois. Yeah, he's an RFA. He's with, got arbitration rights. I'm curious how that's going to go. Are we going to be on arbitration hearing watch I, when the I, dates come out? I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I don't think. I mean, if they know that this, you know, they're not talking about a long term deal, they're looking to kick the can down the road for one season. Mm -hmm. I think they get together with, I believe, Pat Brisson is his agent yep. um, and work out a one year deal like has happened on a number of other occasions. And then as the season goes on, you know, look at the situation and hopefully it's a much better one for a guy like Dubois to consider being here long term. And next year, if they know that that ain't happening, then you probably do have to trade the player. Uh, I know there'd be a lot of interest in Pierre-Luc Dubois and the return would be great. But again, when you're trading a player like that in the prime of his career, much like many people's, you know, aversion to moving Mark Shifley right now. It's very difficult to win that trade immediately, but we have seen a number of trades, you know, that work out well long term for the club. And it just depends on where you are as far as that, um, um, where you are in the process of uh, being a real contending team. The Jets thought they were there a couple of years ago. They've obviously taken a step back. And in a lot of ways, this is the crossroads for the team and for many players over the course of the next 12 months. Yeah, I agree. And we'll have to wait and see what happens uh, with the coach, you know, we haven't even mentioned uh, any any meetings or anything coming on. I think that's step one. And, you know, step two, I mean, how the team does. If you win, you know, people want to stay. I mean, no one was really talking about this uh, back in, in 2018. So, again, I don't I agree with you. I don't blame Dubois for wanting to take a wait-and-see approach, just how the salary cap has been because of the, you know, lost revenues from the pandemic, but also the state of the team. And if you win, cures everything, and we'll see – how it goes and maybe you can have a great season and think, Hey, you know what? I, I like it here, but, uh, that was definitely, um, upsetting seeing that if you're a Jets fan, seeing that during, you know, you're trying to watch the Stanley cup final, watch some great hockey and you get that bomb. Uh, th thanks Elliot for the for timing. That one. The timing of it was quite interesting. I will say that. And I'm not sure, you know, whether that was just brought forth to Elliot or whether the agent and you were in conversations and he got that, but, yeah, the timing did raise a few eyebrows. Uh, but again, first things first for the Jets, figure out who the head coach is and move forward. Speaking of head coaches, Maurice. Maurice had his opening press conference today in Florida. And I'll tell you what, he 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 had a lot of uh he had a lot of great quotes saved over the course of six months, uh, ready to go today for the new fans in in South Florida. We'll talk about that with Matt Libel coming up in just a second. Steve Coolius a little later on in the program, all over last night's thrilling OT victory for the Avalanche, who are one win away from winning the Stanley Cup. And Brandon Rewicki's coming on as well. Hey, before we do that, 
big shout out to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. Saturday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Linden Ridge uh, location, 1751. Vita Health is hosting their block party and barbecue. Bring the whole family down for face painting, games, product samples, and free lunch. So we're going to try and pop by there for a little while, so maybe we'll see you there. And, of course, at Vita Health Fresh Market, you'll find great prices on Winnipeg's best selection of natural organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, delicious lunch options, and great barbecue options with delicious lean bison steaks or chicken as well. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. Uh, Tell you what, Andrew and the gang over at F Apparel, I think we're quite busy over the last little while. We saw a number of beautiful F Apparel suits, and we hadn't seen them for a while. Of course, over at that amazing Rady dinner, we're going to talk about it with Matt Libel coming up. If you do need a suit, every guy needs at least one that fits and looks great, or a number of other custom men's clothing options, pop down and see the guys at F Apparel. They're at 190 Smith Street downtown, or you can find them online at F Apparel, E-P-H Apparel.com. Uh, some more monsters coming out of Aikens Lake. We'll be heading there later on this summer. If you're looking for an incredible fly-in fishing option right here in the province of Manitoba where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg, Aikens Lake is the place. And as great as the fishing is, the hospitality, the people there are even better. Aikenslake.com online or uh, hit up Pit Turan and see what they're pulling out of the lake on Twitter at Aikens Lake. Uh, and of course, Wallace and Wallace are Winnipeg's fencing and overhead door specialist. You've seen their fences and trucks all over the city. They've been doing it for over 75 years if you need a fence, they've got you covered. Vinyl, ornamental, welded wire, chain link, or wood. And hey, if it's time to replace your garage door, they have Winnipeg's largest selection of overhead garage doors. Give them a buzz at 452-2700. One of the Wallace experts will arrange a time to come out and give you a free estimate. You can also visit them at wallacefences.com or pop down to their showroom on Lawson Road off of Keniston. All right, we'll hook up with Rewiki later. Lots of hockey talk today. Steve Coolius later on. But let's welcome in... A good friend of the program. And may I say, an individual that delivered an absolute clinic, a masterclass, if you will, in emceeing on Tuesday night. And of course, we had a great time interviewing Emmett Smith together. It is the one and only Rabbi Matt Libel. What's good, dude? How are you? That was, oh my gosh. You're very kind to me. Thank you very much. Um, I, it was a blast seeing you in person. Um, and then getting to talk to Emmett Smith and getting to be with all those great sports fans and everybody at the Rady dinner there on Tuesday night. It, it was just great. It was, uh, I will tell you, I'm lucky enough to say that at 37 years old, I've had a few thrills in my life. You and I were at the Super Bowl one time. I know you went to the Super Bowl a few times when we got to, that was a thrill. But having Emmett Smith one point in their dinner conversation before the interview, make a joke and then lean at me and say what do you think about that rabbi give me a <laughs> fist bump i'm not sure that there's really any more point in going forward here because how can you top that how can you top the nfl's all-time rushing leader giving you a fist bump and calling you rabbi i don't know if, i don't even know if that's gonna happen for you Huss, sometime but um it happened for me tuesday and it was just part of a superb superb day and superb night it was wonderful well, look at that look, look at that photo That's look amazing. at those guys dressed up with the all-time leading rusher it really was a thrill and you know it made it that much better of just how cool he was i mean what a, i mean the opportunity to sit down at that head table with you know really a who's who a winnipeg sports as well at the table but having emmett there being able to pick his brain for what happened it really set up i think what certainly from the feedback of everyone was a really fun 40 minutes with us getting to chat with him and uh and hey just while we're at it before we tr tr transition over back to the jets and everything else happening around here um huge huge props to Lori and alan everyone that went rob and zach that put that dinner together two years away you wonder how things will return that thing returned bigger and better than ever before my god the generosity of the people in the room to support all those amazing programs was uh was staggering so it was an honor just to be included it was great to be there doing it with you again and uh, that was a night i think uh we won't forget for a long time but hopefully the folks that were there as well will be the same and i think a lot of people you know they bring in this dinner is has become legendary for the the caliber of guests. They're close to five decades of this. It's and, insane. And 
you think about this, right? Like if you just run down the list of like the last 10 years, it includes Alex Rodriguez, Magic Johnson, Peyton and Eli Manning, Tamu Solani, Emmett Smith. That's just Breeze, recently. Marino, Berman, Bettman. Yeah. I, I, that, and again, all recently, Joe Montana. Um, and then you wonder though, you always wonder. People always say to me, well, Emmett Smith, he's a huge name. But has he got anything to say? Like, what's he going to talk about? Is he is he entertaining guy? Is he? We didn't know. And the best part, I think, for us was that we got to sit at the table together and have dinner. And he made a joke about this in our interview that he felt like he got interviewed twice, once during the dinner with me firing a lot of questions at. But we had to get a temperature of the guy and see what he was like. And I think I don't know about you, but from the moment he opened his mouth, you could tell that this is the sort of guy you would want to hang out with, oh, yeah. have a couple of beers with. He had. He had funny stories. He had more serious stories. He was no shortage of confidence talking about himself or his career, but also was very, very generous in the praise he gave to guys like Jerry Jones, Cowboys owner. We never really got to that in our formal interview, but we did talk about Troy Aikman. We did talk about Michael Irvin and just some of his legendary teammates. Oh yeah. Moose Johnson, his fullback. Right. So, um, when your nickname is Moose, by the way, that's like the greatest nickname. For a fullback? I mean, I think the only better one was Ironhead Hayward. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I wonder what Mike Sellers' nickname was. He was fantastic. Uh, but but he had great stories and he had great messages too. A lot of people I talked to after the event agreed with me when they kind of said they were they were surprised, they were pleasantly surprised with how well spoken and how inspirational. Emmett Smith was. So um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to hear any of that interview after the fact. If there is and you missed it, try and seek that out. But if you have an opportunity to see Emmett Smith in other situations, he is definitely worth the price of admission. And again, what a what an absolute thrill. For, and, and how about this? House? A superstar, legendary athlete who is shorter than you and I. Like that was the coolest part. If you look at that picture, we're all standing and we're all basically. You the were same so height, fired right? up about that. You were so I was fired so up fired about up. that. It just and gives yeah. you hope, right? If you're five foot nine, you can be all time. He did he did get the interview process a couple times. I took advantage of the uh, plenty of time. You were up well in the crowd at the podium with hitting him with on some other sides. And I'll just say this to finish up our conversation about Emmett. Um you know, the football life series uh, that the National Football League has done is incredible. Um, you know, to prepare for this, I wanted to, you know, get every bit of content I could have on Emmett. It's about 45 minutes. It's on YouTube. If you're a Cowboys fan or a fan of Emmett Smith, watch that. The Hall of Fame speech as well um, is is really special. And for those of you that like a good laugh, there is an Emmett Smith roast online where it's him and Shaq and Jamie Foxx and Jeff Ross, the king, the king of the roast. Um, and I believe this was in 2010 or 2011. I'm not sure whether you can get away with this, these bits today, um, but it's there on YouTube. If you want a good laugh, check that out as well. Matt Libel, the sports rabbi, is with us. Uh, certainly was a great night, and thanks again to everyone that supported the Rady JCC 50th anniversary dinner, and uh, we'll look forward to hopefully doing it again next year. Maddie, I know you've stepped away a little bit from the day-to-day -day grind of the Winnipeg Jets, but still pay very close attention to the team, and uh, whew, what, a, what an off-season we are embarking on right now. They need a new head coach. We've heard that Blake Wheeler and the team might mutually agree it's time to move on. There is everything coming out of Mark Shifley's both play and comments at the end of the season. And now we hear from Pierre, from uh, Elliot Friedman. Not that I'm surprised about this. I certainly don't think the time is right for it. But <clears throat> people are freaked out today that Pierre-Luc Dubois has said that at this point, he intends to test unrestricted free agency in two years. What do you make of the... Uh, Huge list of things to do for Kevin Cheveldayoff to get this team back on track and avoid a disappointing season like we just had. It's tough to be. <laughs> it's tough to be optimistic. <laughs> tough to. It's tough even before the Dubois stuff, like the Pierre Luc Dubois thing. Like you said, he had that first season where he got traded in the middle. Never really found his footing. But last year he was he was fantastic. And signing him long-term, I think everybody wants that organizationally and from the fans. 
But even before that news came out, which I'm with you, I heard your conversation with Remo kind of right before you brought me on. I agree. I agree with, with Michael when he says that winning could probably cure this. I'm not sure that they're in position to win this coming year, though, so I don't know how realistic that is. But I also, I, I, look, we all know that Winnipeg is, even if they win, probably never going to be a free agent destination in this league. But they're always going to have to build it, shovel day off and company from within. They drafted well over the first decade plus, for the most part, especially in the first round. And they and they built a great team that you guys are talking about it as well, went in 2018. But I can't, I, we can't think that that's surprised. But to your, to your question, I, I really feel like this team is headed for, unfortunately, some rough years. I, I just don't know how you could feel like the direction is going up yet. I think that it doesn't have, we're not talking about like a five plus year necessarily sort of thing. Like I think that they've got still good pieces and still young pieces and they can build. I mean, they still have one of the best goaltenders in the league, I believe. And they still have great players. Kyle Connor is one of the best scorers in the league. I, I still think that they have good role players around them too, but there's no question that Blake Wheeler in a few years has lost a step. There's no question that Mark Shifley is not really ever going to be a defensive player, at least not in this team or this system, and that there seem to be enough smoke. There seems to be enough smoke that people have got to believe that there are some kind of locker room issues. Oh, that was obvious to everyone. Hey, do you think the salvage, what's your opinion on the Shifley situation as far as, I mean, there will be a new head coach. Um, Whether he's on the Winnipeg Jets in training camp, we'll see. But how salvageable do you think it is? I mean, you know, as down as many people, myself included, was on Mark and the way that he played and, you know, handled himself last year. Um, it was obviously very concerning, I think, to anybody paying attention. And I'm sure, well, I right. know that that's rippled through the organization as well. Um, let's say Barry Trotz does sign up to be the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, a guy that comes in with a Stanley Cup ring, with a pedigree of winning, and will command respect the second he walks in and will start, I would assume, a clean slate with everybody in that room. Can they get the most out of Mark Shifley? Can they, can this continue for the next couple well, of years, do you think? We have the position of following his career literally from the day that he was drafted through. And I always thought the thing on Shifley was that he was incredibly coachable. I thought that's what the late Dale Howarchuk said about him when he was his coach in Barry. Uh, that was a big reason why they drafted him when no one really knew. Remember, no one knew who Mark Shifley was when he was drafted. When he put on that jersey, it was the NHL jersey. They didn't even have the actual team they didn't have the logo from that moment people were like they reached who is this guy what i heard at that time i think you heard it too and then for several years leading up to his nhl really like really debut and then taking off and becoming an elite top six center an elite top line center that he was he was so coachable he was coachable by howard check he was coachable by noel a little bit he was certainly coachable by my, by maurice but he does not look like a player who is coachable yeah, he's he coachable like by Adam Oates right now, which unfortunately is all about the individual and not about the team. Right. And and he was always so – but, like, to me, I'm very surprised by someone who is so committed to those Gary Roberts, Adam Oates regiments and takes that so seriously as a young player, knowing what he has to work on individually, and then isn't part of – and can't be coached within the team context. So that doesn't make sense to me. To, to me, if you're a selfish player, you're not going to respond to any kind of level of coaching. But to have, and we know that Shifley is so bought in from what he eats, from how hard he works. They talked about it, talked about him being a sponge, soaking all these things up. And you could see it with his development that was very exponential in the early years of his career to get to where he was an elite player. But what's happened in the last couple of years? Now, I'm not in that room, and I've never met the guy. I've never spoken to him before. But I don't know. Doesn't he kind of look like someone who has enjoyed some successes? and has maybe lost a little bit of the perspective that he seemed amazingly to have when he was younger, before the financial success. And I guess a little bit of team success a few years ago, but especially personal success. I, he just, he seems to have lost his way. The thing about Barry Trotz is, he seems able to coach anybody, right? I mean, Alex Ovechkin didn't have a cup. Hmm. A lot of players on that team were uncoachable. Uh, Alex Ovechkin Trotz. was thought to be a coach killer. Exactly. So Barry, now the only problem is, do we really, really believe Barry Trotz is coming here? I mean, I, I said something on Tuesday night. I hope he would, but he hasn't signed yet. He hasn't signed anywhere. He hasn't signed yet. And 
But to your question, could he salvage? If anybody could do it, Barry Trott seems to be that guy. But I'm less concerned about who the coach is and more concerned about who's Mark Shifley these days. Like, what has happened to Mark Shifley up here? And guys like us, I don't know if we ever really get that answer unless we're in that room and we're not invited into that room because we'll <laughs> talk about it publicly. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big concern. I, I just... To get back to the, I think that the Jets are in for a, a rough couple of years, and I don't say that happily. I just say well, that. Well, here's the thing about the two years, dude. I think it. The, like the two years is so significant. I mean, two years right now is basically the window that you have with Dubois, with Shifley, and with Hellebuck. And we all know that you know with assets like that in a market like Winnipeg, you cannot just play it out for two years and then start all over again. Um, and that's why, to me, it's not two years, it's one year. It's what happens this year. Who's the head coach? How much can they change the atmosphere, the culture around the club? Can guys enjoy being Winnipeg Jets again? Do they like playing with each other? Do you have a real team together? And can you have some success? And if you do that, then I think we're having an entirely different conversation about where the team is at and, you know, how attractive it might be to stick around. Because as I said, you know, a lot of people will talk about the weather and the city and, you know, all that stuff. I really think that that's small in the big picture when these guys are making decisions. And I think we can show that evidence by the long-term contract signed successfully by Kevin Shaveldayoff with so many people in the organization up until this point. It's a very different story, though, if you don't look like you're trending in the right direction, if it doesn't look like you're going good places, if you're on the other side coming down and no one's having any fun, um, that's not a great position to be in if you're trying to keep guys around. So I think that both what happens coming up to training camp and before the first game of the regular season and what we see next year will essentially define the direction of what happens with this team in a year from right now, in next year's offseason, because that's when those decisions really will have to be made unless you're planning on just hanging on to guys, seeing what happens through the season, and if you have to, dealing them at the deadline. Which has never, which hasn't really been their style. Absolutely the team, not. Th this is also kind of a new situation, right? Because they, were, they weren't an expansion team, but they were basically like an expansion kind team. And they had to <laughs> build and build and build and build. And then they had some couple of years where they had success and they felt like they could really compete at a very high level, top five cup contending team. And then, yeah, I mean, last season, not the season we just had, but the season before, I think people were really optimistic because they swept the Oilers. Right? Things were looking good, but then they got bounced themselves in the second round. And then, of course, this year, don't even make the playoffs at all. I, I agree with you that this year is incredibly telling, but I think that only adds more weight to what I'm saying. There's no way you can convince me that even with Hellebuck and Connor and Ehlers, Wheeler and Shifley and Dubois, that this year that they're set up to be, to have that kind of success that could reverse the trend because that same cast of characters drove um, an all-time winning head coach out of town, basically throws hands up and mm -hmm. say, I don't want to coach you anymore. Do we Take not think that that off. was long overdue though? I mean, I think we can now look back. I think we can now look back at what's happened, at least the world for I'm sitting in and fill us in in the chat with your thoughts on this, that, and Maurice himself said that he had had conversations about stepping away before. I mean, it's quite obvious that the organization absolutely loved him and was invested in him and really did believe that he would be the guy that would eventually get the Jets to where they want to go. But when I look back at what happened in the 18-19 season, in the second half of that year, <clears throat> the loss to St. Louis, um, I think many other clubs would have maybe made that decision at that point. And if you had that new head coach coming in with the team that had obviously had a bunch of internal issues, but was with a maybe a new voice going into that following season, I'm not sure we're in. I mean, again, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback all this stuff. But, um, I mean, for the fact that Paul Maurice had to basically fire himself and walk away, um, you know, I think it's quite clear that it went on too long and now they're really up against it because um, this next coaching hire has the opportunity to salvage it, but I think it's much more difficult to do right now considering the trend of this team, especially last season with everything we know on and off the ice.
Didn't they still have a really good start to the next season, though, after the loss to St. Louis? I mean, St. Louis did win the Cup that year. And the Jets were in so many games. They had that one game in particular. Wasn't it game five where they lost in the dying seconds of that game where it should have gone to OT? Um, didn't they have a good start the following year? Wasn't that? Am I remembering they, this wrong? They had, well, I mean, that was 1920? the... 1920? Well, 1920. I mean, in 1920. In the fall. Yeah. The year that was, ended up being cut by the, the by pandemic. And then they played in the bubble. Right, where more teams got to make the playoffs and the Jets got bounced by Calgary. I, mean, yeah. I thought, the, I thought that okay. that season started really well. Well, the weird thing was last season was the season that started really well. I mean, at the end, in November, when the Jets were playing the Oilers, the Jets were challenging for first place. They had their best fifth, first 15-game right. starts in the history of the club. And That's then, right. ironically, both the Oilers and the Jets went into the tank for a considerable period of time. Both of them had coaching changes. Jay Woodcroft ended up completely turning things around, re-energizing the Edmonton Oilers, having one of the best records in the league and getting them to the conference finals. And unfortunately, Dave Lowry did not get the buy-in. And I still think he was put in an impossible situation considering Agreed. what had happened. Um, uh, but, you know, we are where we are right now. But um, this, it, it, uh, it, it seemed like what we saw last year, there was evidence of it really dating back to the St. Louis loss and the three months heading into that. So um, anyways, what, what did you make of Maurice though going to South Florida and the Panthers? I mean, I... The, the line that really, really struck me, I didn't hear him speak, but I read some of his comments that within five minutes of talking to Bill Zito, who is the, uh, the GM there, right? He wanted to play for him. He wanted to coach for him. And Paul Maurice always struck me as a guy who was very thoughtful, who took his time to, to, reveal that he was so there immediately, I think is actually very telling, very damning about the Winnipeg Jets because it says to me, yeah, I still wanted to coach, but I had to get out of that Winnipeg situation as quickly as possible. And this is a guy whose entire family really lives here. And I think we'll probably continue to live here. Like he Listen, loves the city. We know Maurice. The Maurice is the greatest order. I mean, do we really take too much out of this? Or do we just realize that this is the guy that knows exactly what to say? He knows the audience that he's talking to. And he's going to come in with a few zingers that's going to make everybody feel great. That time that he spent on TV really shaped him, right? Like he never pulled that kind of stuff with the Leafs like 15, 16 years ago when he was the head coach there. He didn't have that same kind of confidence swagger but you're right he, he is that kind of guy I, I don't i just found that he, he seems he seems to be excited again and that just only makes me think and maybe it's where my mind is at as a jets fan as a jets fan that the the jet situation whether you're right whether he should have been gone longer before or or not it definitely ended with a little bit of a bitter taste for him you know he had to he had to resign it was that that in itself was so strange I've never heard of a coach doing that. Like, what coaches do that? Usually you get canned. You know, it's it's just very, it's very strange. So I think he's going to have a lot of success there. I think he, um, he's worth walking in, you know, talk about walking into a situation as the head coach. Had new head coach of Winnipeg, uphill battle. New head coach of Florida, obviously, they're disappointed with how their season ended. But look at the talent. Look at the season they had there. Plus, the weather just puts you in a good mood all the time in the winter. So I think he's got a, a fantastic situation there. And I think that here in Winnipeg, they've got big shoes to fill. People would say to me, they need to fire Maurice, they need to fire Maurice. And my question to them was always, who are you going to get? Well, right, we always said Barry Trotz, but we didn't think he'd be available. Now it potentially could happen, although it'll be so quite disappointing why, if it doesn't. So then why is it taking so long? Cassidy gets hired by Vegas in a second. Now, I understand he had a relationship with George McPhee. That's fine. The Flyers went and got Tortorella. <laughs> and reportedly offered Barry Trotz $7 million a year to come, and he said no. So what's he waiting for? Well, I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of things. And, and listen, they could have something done. Like, Make no mistake about it. They could be working on assistant coaches. They could be working on a number of things for his family. It's been well documented. He's got a son with Down syndrome. It's very important to him to have a very good situation for he and his family. And I guess the other thing, Matt, is that, you know, it's well within his right to take all the time he wants because let's not forget, he's getting a $4 million check from Lou Lamorello not to coach next year if he's not quite ready to make a decision. So um, I can't say that I'm entirely surprised that it's taken as long as it has. You would love to 
get things going a little quicker, reportedly from Pierre Lebrun. We'll kind of find out some certainty one way or the other by the 1st of July, which is not ideal if it doesn't go your way. But if the Jets get their guy, um, you know, being patient, doing everything they can to do it, you know, obviously would end up being exactly what they want to happen. And they're more than willing to wait. If it doesn't happen, though, you wonder how much work they've done. And it's certainly, we've heard that they've interviewed other candidates. They've got that other list, but still all in on Barry Trotz. And if they're able to get him, I think that gives us the best chance of having, you know, a significant rebound quickly, um, as well as taking care of many of the other things that I think were impactful in the disappointing season on and off the ice for the Jets. All I know is that it worries me. Maybe... This is the difference between you and me. You're you're an optimist, and sometimes I maybe go the other way. You're the spiritual you, leader, man. You're supposed to be. Uh, you're supposed to be the one that the, shines light, light know, on the but room. When, but when it comes to the Jets, I worry that Trotz is taking his time because he's not sure, and him being not sure really concerns me because I don't know how he's going to be convinced. Now, what would he be not sure about? Two main things. There's something organizationally, something within True North. That alarms him or concerns him, or there's something within this locker room that, like you said, is well documented, concerns him. And he's going to say, at this point in my career, do I want to be doing this? Do I need to babysit? Do I need to take talented athletes and straighten their heads out like this? I mean, or do we have to go in and make some serious changes before we even hit the ice next year? That don't underestimate the possibility of that. Because I do think right. that if Barry Trotz is the head coach, I think we're going to see even more player movement that maybe we've thought of or have been expecting because he knows this team quite well. He'll be very much caught up to speed on the issues that the team's had in the past, and he will have a very impactful voice in that decision. We can't forget the fact that it's been well-documented that this next step for Barry probably will be his last coaching stop, and he wants a path into management, which has been reported that is certainly there with True North and I think would be great for the organization. That would be very cool. So if he's he's in, you got to sweeten that deal and get him in there because, like you said, they have work to do. And if he's not in, they need to figure out who's going to have that job. They can't, you know, like they can't continue to waste more precious time in the summer when the winter that's looming is as big as as you put out that it's going to be. I mean, this season, it's do or die for this team. Are they basically on the verge of a rebuild? Or can they still salvage the talent of a team that was really, really well put together over a decade, got to the conference finals four years ago, lost to the cup champions the next year in the first round, but was like 2018, 2019 right there. And then the Buffalo thing, Truba, Myers, Sherratt, those guys all leave. And this team is starting to look very, very different. My, spite of being a spiritual leader, <laughs> I, I noticed trends. And the trend of this team going down shine the light shine the light my friend let's light the candles and uh let's believe going forward uh, hey man it, it... <laughs> i have to tell you one thing about that we're at the table the candles emmett smith said something about i should light a candle for him and i was like yeah man, man in judaism we light candles for people on the anniversary of their death <laughs> He's like, don't light a candle for me. <laughs> Man, so great seeing you on Tuesday and great having you back on the program. Let's do this soon. We didn't even get a chance to talk any baseball, but uh, we'll do that at some point soon. Oh, geez, all the man. best to That's all the best to Heather and the boys. And uh, let's do this again soon. Thanks so much for popping by. Us, Remo. Thanks for having me. All the fans, keep it up. Winnipeg Sports Talk, place to be for sports fans in Winnipeg. Absolutely you, great. You know what? It's funny. And actually, Rewiki's coming up next. And, uh, you know, you being, you know, a close personal friend with John Tortorella. And now we're going to get the, the John Tortorella fan club president coming in next. It's just a perfect segue. Tortorella and I will have our moment. We'll break bread <laughs> somewhere down the line. He'll call me rabbi and fist bump me and uh, it'll all be good. But until that moment... He and I are on the outs. Be well, my friend. Thanks for doing you this. Too. Oh, Thanks. man. Great stuff with Matt Libel joining us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. As I mentioned, we, uh, we, by the way, we will have those comments from Maurice a little bit later on. We'll also get to what John Cooper had to say last night and today. Uh, but just before we do that, a big thanks to our friends at Culligan Water, the water experts in Winnipeg for 65 years for supporting Winnipeg Sports Talk. They've got you covered with water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, drinking water systems, and citywide water delivery services, not to mention commercial and industrial water 
water products and solutions. Whether you need uh, your water for the home, your cottage this summer, or the office, Culligan Water are the experts and have everything that you need. Hit them up at 694 5180. They're at 1200 Sargent Avenue or online at drinkculligan.com. Hey, I got to give a shout out to David LaFantasy. David sent us a message yesterday, popped in to see Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery, got a chance to hold the Donnie bobblehead and took a picture of it and sent it over to us. And of course, uh, David knew from listening to Winnipeg Sports Talk that when you need batteries, Manitoba Battery is the place to go. And great news right now, if you want to get some extra stuff done during the week to make the most of your weekend, extended hours for spring and summer until 8 p.m. And the bottom line is when you deal with Manitoba Battery, you'll be shopping local and you'll save time and money over the big box stores. 1026 Logan Avenue, 783-8787. You can give them a call in advance. Their experts will get your order ready for you to pick up quick and easy and check out everything they've got waiting for you online at manitobabattery.com watch the uh, game last night with my boy greg from royal sports and uh there is another big tent sale coming up the famous royal tent sales haven't had them for a couple years so it's going to be a few this summer thousands and thousands of items shoes merchandise and more all at a minimum of 50 percent off saturday and sunday at royal sports 750 pemina highway if you've never been to a tent sale and seeing the great deals at Royal. Make a point of getting down there this weekend. And of course, follow them on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for all the latest merchandise drops, sale news, and latest on the tent sale. And uh, of course, a big cheers to our friends at Not Auto Corp. Cannot wait to see Trev and the gang at the Bomber game coming up. Uh, I know they've got a few bombers rolling in Not Vehicles this summer. Bottom line is, if you're looking for a new vehicle, before you do anything, pop down and see the gang at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery. Uh, talk to them about the Tesla Experience program as well. If you're thinking about going electric, why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Not team, Waverly and McGilvery, or check them out online at not.ca. All right, Steve Cooley is coming up a little later on in the program. Right now, let's get Ruwiki in here and welcome him back. How was your uh, How was your boys' trip down to the Dells? Did you attack any of those mini golf courses? I think I might have set the course record at Pirates Cove. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> it could have also been a hallucination. I, I I don't know, but I was I was there. So thanks for the recommendation. Yeah, no, I I, I made it back semi alive so that was that was the main goal so uh successful weekend you can check that off the books i thought by the time you came back on the program we would be able to talk about a new head coach but uh many of the other dominoes have fallen uh and yet we're still waiting obviously to see what's up with barry trotz uh the flyers apparently offered barry trotz a job he said no uh, but you got your guy, first choice, of course, John Tortorella. What's the uh, before we get to the Jets? How how's the Flyer Nation feeling about the uh, the new bench boss? I don't know. Do we do we have to do this? He's <laughs> perfect for that? Philly, isn't he? No, he. So I I have so many conflicting thoughts about this because, like in a vacuum, Sports is like legitimately a good coach. Like, yeah, is he rough around the edges? Of course he is. Can he be a bit, you know, brash and, and tough to deal with for sure? Bit of a psycho. Bit of a psycho. Yeah, you know. Da, 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 da. But, like, if you take a look at him as a whole, though, like, the dude knows how to get the most out of a hockey team. And, you know, if Pierre-Luc Dubois wasn't here, I think you could make the case that the Winnipeg Jets could have used somebody like John Tortorella to get the most out of out, out of all the skill and talent that they had because he's shown that, you know, when you give me a good group of guys to work with, and I can I can take a team pretty far. You know, obviously the Stanley Cup with Tampa Bay, but even a conference finals with the New York Rangers, and they were only a game or two away from a conference finals with the Columbus Blue Jackets. So he's like he is a good coach, but I I think the main problem that a lot of Flyers fans have with the deal is not even necessarily the fact that it's John Tortorella himself. It's just that it's this broken mindset on what the team is supposed to be right now right because you bring torts in for one reason and one reason alone and that's to try to contend right to try to get into the playoffs and, and try to be a team that's difficult to play against you don't do that if, if you want to rebuild right that he's, he's probably not the guy that you want to bring a bunch of 20 21 22 year old kids along as they start off their pro journey and so that's there's there's the disconnect there i think that that's why most people are upset with this hiring it's just that with the state of where the Flyers are right now, they should be looking more towards stockpiling picks in the top 10 as opposed to 
trying to squeak into wildcard berths moving forward. But, you know, having, having done a lot of reflection, having gone through, I think, five of the six stages of, of grief, <laughs> I've, I've, I've come to acceptance right now. And I, I, I texted Westy this, but the Flyers have destroyed me so much these past few years in particular that I'm now at the point where I'm like a sadist. Like I want to, I want to see somebody go in and kick the ever living crap out of them. Like make, make them hurt as much as they've hurt me. And Tortorella is the guy to do that. Well, you know what? It's funny. You uh, maybe could provide some counseling to some jet fans in the chat right now, because a lot of people are, um, you know, worried. And, and listen, it's because so much of this stuff still hasn't happened yet. And we've got all these issues. Remus kind of joked around oh, a head coaching search. Oh, that's old news. You know, Blake <laughs> Whaler's on the trade block. Dubois going to UFA and all of this happening at the same time. Um, but let's talk about these reports from Elliot Friedman, because I know we've spent quite a bit of time on the coaching search and we all know we're going to find out soon. And if it's Barry Trotz, great. If it's not, we'll see where they go from there. And that obviously is so impactful as to what happens with the club next season. Uh, what did you make of the reports that not only is Blake Wheeler added to Frank's trade bait board, but at number three, but Elliot said this could be something. And obviously it is, uh, you know, it could be mutually beneficial to both sides, meaning that the captain's on board as well. I mean, what was your reaction to that? And what do you think, what would a Blake Wheeler trade look like if the Winnipeg Jets are able to move on from their longtime captain? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because I was shocked. I, I, I was shocked, you know, in looking at how this off season could work. One of the big, one of the big asks that, that Chevy's going to have to try to find a way to, to maneuver through is that they don't have a lot of salary cap space right now. I, I brought up Nate Schmidt in the past. The reason I brought up him is because I just I didn't think Blake Wheeler's contract would be something that was even movable, right? Like, even if both sides are like, hey, let's get this done, how many teams out there can fit eight mil on the cap? And how many of those teams are anywhere close to Colorado, Tampa Bay, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like there's teams that can fit it in, but I don't think Blake Wheeler's going to move to go to, to Ottawa or Buffalo anytime soon. So I, I just didn't think it was really a legit possibility at all. But, you know, maybe now with the Paul Maurice uh, arrival in Florida, I know a lot of people are kind of connecting the dots there that this, this might be something that, you know, a guy that's had a good relationship with the coach for half a decade here, going to a winning team, they could find some cap space. Maybe they could make that work. I, I I don't know if Florida is the destination for that. Although I do know they're trying to move Patrick Hornquist, and he's making over five million dollars for for one more year. So you do wonder if if something's to be had there. But I, I guess my biggest my 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 two biggest points of interest are just one that, like you mentioned there, if, if Blake Wheeler is receptive to it. How the Winnipeg Jets, you know, everybody brought up, they can go the Calgary Flames route, hire a new coach, and hey, we're good again, no need to worry. But I don't think a lot of people were talking about the Minnesota Wild route, where they, they lost a ton of money on the cap, but just wanted the culture shift in getting rid of Parise and Suter, and it didn't hurt Minnesota, at least in well, year it's one been of great. It's been great so far in Minnesota, so far. but we're going to see how they do with 12, 14, and $14 million cap penalties the next three seasons. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's kind of where the Winnipeg Jets, at a much lower rate, obviously, are going to find themselves in, because if they do move them, there's no... I, I would be beyond shocked, unless they take back a, a horrible contract the other way. They're going to have to retain a decent amount of salary on on a Blake Wheeler trade. Now, I wonder for Jets fans, like, what's what's an okay number? Like, is two mil okay? Like, you eat two mil for the next couple of years, and and that's a number that it, you know it hurts, but it's not necessarily crippling like we see in Minnesota. Or do the Jets have to go the full fifty percent? And at that point, you know, is is it worth? Does it, it make sense? Yeah, or, but is or is that the price you pay to? shift the culture in your organization. I, I I don't I don't really know what the answer is. It's it's tough to get a read on it until you know what's coming back and what it's going to cost the Jets to do something like that. But to me, this is way more of a paradigm shift than it is we're just trying to clear out salary cap space because I think if the Jets wanted to do that, they could do that without giving up a ton of draft picks, a ton of assets. This is more of a, a, a bullhorn to the rest of the NHL and, and inside that locker room that this is going to be a different Winnipeg Jets team moving forward. Which is good. I think it's mandatory. They have to have that. We know Maurice is gone. And listen, for a long time, his team was essentially run by Maurice, who turned the keys over to Wheeler and Mark Shifley. And 
you know, both of those players who have been the cornerstones of this franchise are now in limbo. And I'll say this right now. And I mean, I know we said, and I still think it's far probably more likely, at least if you said, we got to trade one of these two guys, your ability to trade Mark Shifley is 10 times easier to do it. And your returns better than Blake Wheeler. But it does seem, especially with hearing what we've heard on both of those players throughout the off season, I think it'd be highly unlikely that both of them are Winnipeg Jets come October. Just crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy to think about it. But like, how how can you ignore it? And and people can make fun of trade lists and all that stuff. But I mean, fr- Frank tweeted out the Kraken's roster before ESPN went to air. Like the the <laughs> dude the dude's plugged in. I, I'm gonna trust him that if if Blake Wheeler's making his debut at number three, that this is much more than just smoke out there that there's some some legit possibility. Well, what's funny is that Shifley's not on that list. And if you had asked me a month ago, hell, a week ago, who's more likely to be gone next year from the Winnipeg Jets, I would have said Shifley for the myriad of reasons with the the contract, the value. But again, if you are looking at completely turning over the leadership and bringing more of these younger players that have been knocking on the door and ready for it that maybe haven't had that opportunity, maybe it is the captain, the guy that has been, you know, the guy with the C on his chest that that you do move out, although easier said than done. But the fact that these conversations are having, and it's what's important about this too, Brandon, I think that, you know, we should note, you know, it's a full no move up until July 1st. Then it becomes a very limited no trade deal with five teams. But the minute you hear that the player is also open to moving, I think we can safely say that, yeah, there's probably still a few teams that he's not taking a trade to and he'd rather be here, but it does sound like a change of scenery is attractive to that player. And you can essentially count on being far more than five teams in that situation that he might be open to moving to. Yeah. A no move turns into an I'll move pretty quickly. Right. <laughs> so I, 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 that's honestly the least of the Winnipeg Jets worries, honestly, is, is trying to find, or try to convince Blake Wheeler to, to wave if they do find a deal. It's just going to be trying to find the right fit. And and that's the other intriguing part of this, right? Like, is there a contending team out there that that looks at this situation and goes, you know what, we're we're a Blake Wheeler away from contending. And it's not, you know, it's not like bringing Corey Perry in, for example, on a on million dollars for a year. Like, you really got to believe that this is the, the missing puzzle piece to put you over the top because you're probably going to have to move a piece out just to fit somebody like Blake Wheeler in. So I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated that the Winnipeg Jets are, are willing to go down this route. I'm fascinated to see which teams are interested in trying to pull off this deal. I, I doubt the, the hometown wild are going to be uh, one of the teams that are going to have the Cavs space to do it. But the other intriguing part, just because you threw Shifley in there too, is it, it immediately took me back to Carter Hellebuck's, um, well, I guess it wasn't in his presser, but just the revelation that, Ellie's happy in Winnipeg as long as they're trying to win. And while the Jets could win a Wheeler and a Shifley trade in the same offseason, I wonder if a Wheeler and a Shifley trade would then mean 37 wants to find his way out the door, even if the team might be in a better spot. Well, Just I'll say this. I, I, you know what? I, I mean, I kind of think of the team as one thing and then Hellebuck is another because he resides on planet Hellebuck, which is in another (laughs) galaxy and solar system, I think mentally for most of the other players. And I say that with the most admiration. I mean, he's a goalie. Goalies are weird. Um, He's a really good one. It seems like the better the goalies are, the more out there they are. Um, But you're right. I mean, for a guy that's just looking out, um, although he would have seen what had happened last year, he was victimized by a lot of it, by the lack of buy-in, particularly by Mark, you know, and, you know, listen, it's great to get those points, but if, uh, you know, 37's fishing the puck out of his net repeatedly, I mean, that will make an impact, but it, it does seem to be as much as we're talking about, you know, there's, you know, people say, well, you can't trade Shafley, Shafley because, you know, there's no way you can win that trade. It's pretty clear from everything that we're hearing right now and everything that we saw last year and we heard at the end of the year, that as much as, you know, there's a risk involved in what you're doing by moving one of these players out, the uh, the concept of addition by subtraction to the atmosphere around the team, to the team concept and what other players might do in their absence um, is a big part of these conversations as well internally. Yeah, well, you know, the Winnipeg Jets went down this route before, too, you know, trading Jacob True, albeit for much different reasons, right? But trading the most talented player in the deal 
And everybody assumed it was a loss, you know, in the short and long term. And, you know, even after a down year for Pionk, I don't think anybody here in Winnipeg wants to, to redo that deal, right? So it is it is possible to to make a trade, including somebody as skilled as Mark Scheifele. And while on the surface you might not win it, you know, it, it turns out that it, it could work in your favor right away. But that's Look what Colorado uh, did with Duchesne. Yeah, I, I was just I was just gonna say that, right? Like and, and it might not bear fruit in game one of next season. It, it may maybe it takes a year or whatever it is, but like all all you're trying to do as a GM is improve your team any way you can. And and while I would always lean towards you know dealing the best player at a trade is usually going to end up poorly for you. Sometimes I think there are extenuating circumstances to where it's it's the right move and maybe the only move for your team. And I think the Winnipeg Jets find themselves in that you know in that mold right now and. Again, I I think if they do go down that route, there's more than enough teams out there in the NHL that'll pony up big time for Mark Shifley. Like they're not going to care about the defensive this, lack of buy in that. They're going to see what's that ninety points, six million dollar cat. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're, we're gonna in for that. We're we're, we're going to worry about all that. That's a I, problem. I believe that a hundred percent as well. So if it's a team like Carolina, which I think is a, a great fit. For the Jets, a team that probably looks like they need a bit of a, a secondary offensive punch and looking to take that next step after a disappointing playoff exit. You know, if it's Marty Nekash and somebody else, hey, maybe Nekash comes in next year and puts up 60 some odd points. Or, or you trade him to L.A., who's who's looks to be extremely aggressive again. They were in the Eichel sweepstakes. Maybe you, I mean, God help Winnipeg if we get Quentin Byfield here. That, that would be just something else, right? But like, there are ways where... The Jets can turn this situation from a dicey one into both a win, a win in the now and a win, you know, maybe more importantly in, in, in the future, maybe two, three years down the road when this team might be, when you take a look at all the pieces that are here right now, might be more able to contend once Colorado and Tampa Bay's windows have shut. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, you mentioned Byfield. And to me, I mean, God, I know we've like many people, we've spent a lot of time looking at cap friendly, looking at players, looking at their contracts and where I mean best case scenario if they do make a deal like that and again it might be a bit of a step back right now and other players will have to step up um but because of it's winnipeg because of the challenges that shovel dayoff has as being the general manager here as opposed to new york or la um the guy i would like to see come back as a player that could be playing in the middle but is at a different stage in their career byfield would be at the top of the list i love dylan cousins i don't know if there'd be any way that you could get him out of buffalo um, but you know, a player like that, where you've got some time to get them into this, to have them grow. Um, and you're not looking at, well, like the jets are right now with Dubois with two years left and then potential unrestricted free agency. And that's sort of been, you know, the MO of the Winnipeg jets when they've made trades, the Truba, uh, Truba trades, a perfect example. You get a player like Pionk under team control. You get a first round pick that you turn into Billy Hanla and you hope that down the road, it makes you better. Um, I spent quite a bit of time talking about the Dubois report last night from Elliot Friedman at the start, but I'm interested in your thoughts on it. I mean, I'm not surprised. I mean, this team had a miserable season. It sounded like it sucked to be in the locker room and be around the team last year, and they still don't have a head coach. So the fact that he's not saying, yeah, yeah, hit me up with an eight-year deal doesn't really surprise me. Um, but um, what did you think of it? Yeah. <laughs> what, what did you think was going to happen, <laughs> right? Like, I'm I'm the same way as you. You think he's just, yeah, eight, eight years, seven mil, sure, I'll take it, no big deal. And it's funny because, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was on here saying, what a long-term deal might look like for him. It wasn't, he's going to accept this, this long-term deal <laughs> the second that it's offered to him. I mean, there's there's two things that stand out to me, really. The first is that, I mean, I, I don't necessarily blame the fans here for being this way, but it is a fatalistic bunch right now. Because the the moment that report came out, it was, oh, the city sucks. Oh, Dubois won. Oh, the organization is crap. It's falling apart. Keep in mind, that's just on Twitter. And Twitter isn't real life. True. And like the, the loudest Jet fans on Twitter 
are the most negative. There's a group of them that will whine or take the most negative angle on anything. And I'm not sitting here saying that this was good news by any stretch of the imagination. But yes, fatalistic is a great way of saying it. But I would offer you that that isn't real life. If you talk to fans that are actually at the games more often than not, they won't echo the things that we consistently get on social media. And unfortunately, that's not unique to Jet fans. That is just what social media is about. That's good. That's good then. I'm, I'm glad you brought me back to reality a little <laughs> bit. But I, I mean, when you look at the situation, if you were Pierre Luc Dubois, wouldn't wouldn't you do the same thing? Right? Like, I, I guess my initial reaction first was just nice, nice bargaining tactic. Right? Like, yeah, put put For pressure sure. as much as you can on management. Yeah, two years <laughs> away. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely going. I've already like. <laughs> For, for any 22, 23 year old, if you think they've got their future mapped out more than like a couple of months ahead, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. But like, obviously, he's going to say something, or his agent, you know, more more importantly, is going to say something like that, link it to the insiders, and hey, let's try to put a little more heat on him. And hey, maybe they offer something crazy on a on a seven or eight year deal, and we have no choice but to turn it down. But like, if if I'm in Dubois' shoes right now, to me, there's no reason that I sign anything other than a one-year deal, right? Like you get a chance to play beside one of, I imagine, either Kyle Connor or Nikolai Ehlers this season. There's a chance, and I don't know if he knows this or not, but there's a chance that, you know, Mark Shifley might be gone. And all of a sudden, you're the de facto number one center. Maybe, maybe even, I know a lot of people bring up captain material with them, right? But like an A, at least a letter on your chest, you can kind of take over the mantle of, hey, this is my team play 20 minutes a night, maybe you have a career year, then you head back to the negotiating table next year, a year away from UFA. If you like it, you can stay. If not, then you pretty much have complete destiny over where you spend the next decade of your life, right? So I, to, to me, un unless the Jets really, really wow him with an offer and they do a bunch of things outside of the contract that you'd be appreciative of massive home depot gift card <laughs> like a slur like a 7-eleven slurpee machine in-house like todd mcculloch like I, some something along those lines I, i'm signing to one year deal and and we can revisit this next year and, and even from the jet side of things it, it doesn't it's not the end of the world i mean look at what seth jones got columbus in, in that trade with chicago right and he was a year away from free agency publicly said i'm never playing again i want out they were able to get a massive, massive haul for him. So, you know, even if you're in the boat of we want guys that want to be here and if he's not going to sign long term, we got to move him. Hey, en enjoy the enjoy the level of play that it gives you this year. And you're still going to be able to cash in on those chips if you want to go the trade road next year. Uh, Brandon Ruick is with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to check out uh, the latest from him at Skates and Plates, wherever you get pods. Uh <laughs> We're going to play the comments from Maurice a little later on from another master class in press conference um, operations. But uh, what, what, did, what did you think? What did you, what was your reaction when you heard that Mo is the new head coach of the Florida Panthers? I, I guess, I guess I got to be honest. Cause that's, 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 please do. Please be. I, I thought it was a prank. I, I, I thought, <laughs> I think it was Drager that had it first. Like I had to do like, is it like at, ddd darren drager or something like that like I, I i still can't believe that this is the route the panthers went i i'm beyond beyond shock beyond shock especially in as everybody in winnipeg knows if, if the panthers goal is to become a more like if you're going to term the panthers as something you'd probably say something along the lines of insanely skilled offensive team that might need to improve inside their own zone where does that sound familiar? It's basically been our lives for the past five years. <laughs> so it's it's this crazy combination. And like I don't want to make this a bash Maurice session or anything like that, but it's it's just like to me, this is not this is just a terrible fit between coach and team. I, I just I don't get it at all. And and I can like for me, seeing what Brunette did with the team. I'd be okay with giving him another shot and hey, maybe a year of experience. He's able to fit, you know, figure some things out when it comes to the postseason. But like, I, I also do get if you're a Panthers ownership looking at this and going like, we got to win now. Now we can't wait for a coach to maybe figure it out. We got to find a guy that can do that. I don't know, man, to me that to me, there were better fits out there. And, and I mean, one of them includes 
I could have the Brinks truck for Barry Trotz if you if you really wanted to go that route. I yeah, I, I'm just I'm still stunned. I don't I don't know if I'll ever get I don't know if I'll when it's actually gonna hit into my head that that yeah, Paul Maurice is gonna coach maybe one of the, if not the most talented team in the NHL right now. But having said that on his side, that's a pretty damn good upgrade, like from Winnipeg winters to, to Florida summers. Like that's you want to talk about a turnaround. That's I, I don't know if the Panthers' defensive turnaround is going to be as steep as going from Winnipeg winters to, to Florida summers. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. Well, we'll play the comments from Maurice a little later on. I'll say this about Paul. Um, he is obviously the – and we know how charming, how commanding he is when he speaks to the media and to the fans. I think he's even better with speaking to NHL owners because, and I'll tell you what, if he got out of coaching, he should become an agent because the way he is able to take over and win every meeting he's in, I feel like if he was my agent and I went into negotiations, we'd walk into the room and I'd be asking for $2 million and I'd walk out with three. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> that's the sort of thing he's that good at it so i i'll be interested to see i was talking to pat greg you over a cool bet i was thinking hey can we get a line on will paul maurice be the head coach of the florida panthers on january 1 2025 so essentially into that third year um it's a oh, three-year deal under. Yeah, I, listen, I mean, I think that it's going to go one way or the other, yeah. right? Um, because this is about winning right now. And if they take a step back or if they don't get it done in the next couple of years, um, I don't think there is the patience. Although stranger things have happened <laughs> based on uh, his prior time. I mean, he's gone back to Carolina. He uh, had to basically fire himself here in Winnipeg. So, um, you know, maybe he's just got it's that special, <laughs> special connection. Hey, before we go... Uh, what did you think of the game last night and the bizarre finish? Yeah, I mean, I just I, I don't really get John Cooper's game here. Like, I'm not I'm not a big like don't cry guy, but like seriously, don't cry. And, and not only that, but like you out you out too many men them. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> what are you even doing? Like, oh no, McKinnon was all the yeah. You had seven guys on the ice <laughs> again. Which they did last year against the Islanders. Exactly. Short-handed. <laughs> short-handed against the Islanders. And they scored the like just like just shut up. I he, he's he's had a pretty interesting John Cooper, a pretty interesting like media session postseason run this year. Go going back to his run against the Leafs, playing mind games every chance he got, which I did like that against a, a mentally a mentally fragile Toronto Maple Leafs team. But in this case, it's like, dude, shut up. Just just Take the loss and, and try to find a way to move forward here. Um, Nazem Kadri's a legend. I, I don't know how. How in, I don't know how. Like broken broken thumb surgery. What is it? Less than three weeks ago. I I, I don't get how he's doing it right now. Like how, how you're even able to to hold a stick, let alone pull a move like that. Well, last I, week he was skating without a stick yeah. because he couldn't hold it. I mean, and you want to talk about changing the narrative around a guy? I mean, let's face it. This is a guy that has screwed up over and over again, put his teams in a bad position and cost them in the playoffs when they really needed him. I mean, I'm sure there was a few Leaf fans throwing up in their mouths looking at him be the hero last night, coming off considering what had happened in his prior stop, and then going legend coming back in and scoring an OT winner, a beautiful goal as well, in full Pat Kane style. No one even knew that the puck was in yeah, the net awesome. for about 10 seconds. That was my favorite part of the whole thing. <laughs> Just PTSD all night after watching that. Like, no, it's in the net. <laughs> no. but, oh, yeah, I forgot who that was against. Yeah, yeah no yeah, no, no worries. That's cool. T towards to end it and Patty Kane to finish it. That's a, that's a, it's a great hit. I'm, I'm loving it. But I, I won't say this about the upcoming game. Whoever wins game five wins the series. I, I do think wow. I do even though Tampa Bay is doing their Black Knight from Monty Python on the Holy Grail impression, <laughs> if they find a way to win that game, it is gonna be I, I I just I think Vasilevsky at that point is gonna say, uh uh, like one's gonna be enough the rest of the way, boys, because I don't think they're getting one past me. Colorado is great in that overtime. To me, this is the game to finish it off. Like smell blood. Make it maybe not as crazy as game two was, but just like pedal to the floor, try to find a way to end it in game five. Because if this one goes back to Tampa, then to me, all bets are off at that point. And I think the Lightning, even though they have 
what is it like two or three healthy bodies left i i think i think they're gonna find that so that's my bold prediction here is that if tampa bay finds a way to get this one back to florida that they're gonna be uh they're going to be going back to back to back by the end of this one. Well, uh, I'd be here for it because that would mean we'd get three more games and it has been a really, really fun series. B, awesome. Glad you made it back in one piece and you survived the uh, the tour with the fellas and uh, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, I'll go put the IV back in. Thanks for having me on. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Skates and plates, wherever you grab podcasts, check it out. Make sure you subscribe. Great stuff with Brandon Rewicki. All right. Steve Cooley is coming up in a few minutes. We will get to those comments from Paul Maurice. I'm looking forward to hearing the, from them. Uh, and hey, a quick a leaderboard update. PGA Tour is going on right now. It is the uh, the Travelers Championship. And oh, looky there. Rory McIlroy, 8 under 62. And uh, 8 under 62. Xander Shoffley, a 7 under 63. Webb Simpson in at 6 under uh, pretty nice leaderboard right now at the beginning. Just going down to see if we've got any Canadian flags in it. Uh, Michael Gligic is the top Canadian right now. He's one under through five. Um, of course, our golf reports, always courtesy of our friends over at Breezy Ben Golf and Country Club. If you're looking for an incredible golfing home for your family in the future, talk to Corey Johnson at the club about getting on the waiting list for next year. And of course, you can find out more information on everything they've done over the last couple of years and what is waiting for you at Breezy Bend at breezybend.ca. Bombers tomorrow night, 7.30 game. Princess Auto tailgate party gets going at 5.30. Great deals beforehand. $5 beers, $3.50 hot dogs, $3.50 soft drinks, entertainment from our guy DJ Finesse, and some giveaways from the Princess Auto gang as well. If you're heading to the Bomber game tomorrow, <clears throat> Get out there a little bit early, just outside the stadium. It is the place to be before the game. The Princess Auto tailgate party for all Blue Bomber games this year. <clears throat> and of course, Princess Auto is where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. You can visit them at one of two Winnipeg locations, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, or shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Remind you again, folks, tomorrow, if you uh, got the afternoon off, you're able to drop by, come and join us at Little Brown Jug. It'll be a two for one. You'll be able to check out the show, say hi to the fellows, maybe meet some other people in chat and pick up the great taste of Little Brown Jug to go and have a few pints while you're at it. I'm sure we'll have a few after the show to a little combo pre-gaming before we head over to that Princess Auto tailgate party in the Blue Bomber game. Little Brown Jug tomorrow, 1 p.m. We're live, William Avenue in the exchange. And hey, I gotta give a shout out to Nick or the Nick and Nikki DQ. I still can't believe how good that Reese's Pieces Cookie Dough Blizzard is. It's available right now at your favorite Nick and Nikki DQ. Northgate, Niverville, Polo Park, St. Anne's, and hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. If you need to order a cake, they'll get a custom made for you to be picked up quick and easy at your favorite Nick and Nikki DQ. All right, we'll have the Paul Maurice clips in a few minutes. We'll hit the cool bet lines as well. But right now, let's welcome in the one and only Steve Coolius for a little more NHL talk on WST. Cooley, what's up? Great to have you back on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Guys, I'm glad to be back. Uh, when are we hiring trots? Uh, let's let's get that monster ball out of the way early here. What are we? What's taking so long? Not soon enough. I mean, I don't know. We said we had free beer for him for the for life. We're gonna make his own beer, so I figured that might we we were gonna try to be the closers, but apparently it's taking a little bit longer. Uh, that being said, just quickly on that topic, I mean, what do you make of the coaching moves? Uh, many familiar faces in new spots. Maybe the most surprising though. Um, our old pal Paul Maurice getting the nod in Florida as he's introduced earlier today. Yeah, uh, Paul's going to be on the power play uh, at 5 Eastern, uh, 4 Central today, so check that out. I'm surprised. The moves, and I mean, from Tortorella uh, to Bruce Cassidy, uh, Peter DeBoer, you name it. it it's uh, The coaching carousel has been fun. It's not over yet. We have a few more uh, chairs to give out, and hopefully everything does work out with Barry Trotz. But uh, I love it. I mean... I hope broadcasters and coaches are always the same. Recycle, 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 so we can always hang around no matter what, whether we deserve it or not. So I find it fascinating. I think Bruce Cassidy is going to rock it in Vegas. I really do. I think he's going to be outstanding. 
And I think Vegas is going to go on a bit of a playoff run next year. I think Vegas will be back, baby, uh, to being a special team. Thanks to, in part, Bruce Cassidy. I believe that. What do you think about the fit of Maurice in Florida after such a great season that, of course, ended uh, going up against you know, the team that has been the standard in the NHL for the last three years in Tampa? I think it's going to work out as well. I don't know if that means the Stanley Cup. I, I like Andrew Burnett, but he was too green as a head coach, and this is about winning now in Florida. Uh, Paul's got the same problem in Florida as he did in Winnipeg. A lot of talent, some grit, but they don't know how to play defense and sometimes don't want to. So if he can bring that to South Florida... I think they'll be better. Can they beat the Tampas of the world before certain teams age out? I don't know, but there's a lot to like there. And I guess from Winnipeg winters to South Florida winters, uh, it'll be a little bit different if you know what I'm saying. No idea what you're talking about, Steve. Steve Cooley is with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. What do you think about a potential fit, though, here in Winnipeg for Barry Trotz? For, I mean, a myriad of reasons. The defense you talked about and also a guy that I think would come back and really immediately re-energize a fan base that, um, you know, was feeling the disappointment of the last couple of seasons. It's got to be Barry. It's Barry for all the right reasons. There's enough, there's enough goaltending defense men, the men, uh, skill up front to make it work. It's about winning that 2-1 game instead of having to come back trailing Vegas 4-2. Remember that? Winning in overtime or having a 4-2 lead. There's been too many, too exciting games. Let's dumb it down a little bit so the Jets can win a close regular season game and then have playoff success. I, they don't have to be boring. They just have to be a little less exciting when they've got the lead. I'm not asking too much. So give Barry what he wants. Don't go cheap here. Free beer's one thing. Give him the Sazich and get him signed to a four-year deal at $4 million. That's the going rate. And get it done. And he will bring Winnipeg Jets success in the playoffs i believe that yeah i don't think the sizich is going to be a problem uh, the fact that there's four million on the table to not coach might be the biggest challenge right now the winnipeg jets but i think everyone uh excited and somewhat optimistic that in the next week or so we'll get some clarity and hopefully that has barry trotz coming back to manitoba to be the head coach of the winnipeg jets let's get to the cup final what an absolutely bizarre ending to the game um you know, Steve, I, I'm still wrapping my head around what happened. I mean, we heard John Cooper with his uh, impassioned um, media speech afterwards that he talked more today because of how frustrated he was at apparent too many men. How does that happen? And is it partly an account of the fact that it most people didn't even know that the puck was in the net for a little while before the celebration started? I mean, how do we make sense of what happened last night? Well, it was a great up. Kemper to Arturi Lekkinen and over to Kadri, who made a great play. That's the modern attack the triangle, and McDavid's perfected it better than anyone else. I mean, Mario and Fedorov did it back in the day. Maybe not as good, um, but anyway, uh, and you either go short side shelf or a uh, low blocker, and this one went under the blocker and in. So I wouldn't have called too many men on the ice, and I love John Cooper as a person and a a coach, he's a Hall of Fame coach, and he's a Hall of Fame person, and he's great to us. But let's be honest, boys. In watching that game, it was Hudson Bay flipping rules in the third. Each team already had their two power plays, and they weren't calling anything. If you Howie Meeker stop it right there, Tampa's got seven men on the ice, and Colorado has six. The fact that Kadri cheated at the beginning of the shift, and then McKinnon comes over, he did gain an advantage. How big it is, we can debate. But then he skates the puck into 27 and 98. That's McDonough and then Sergachev and beat Sergachev. If it went Kemper, Kemper right to Kadri and McKinnon was not near the bench, I probably would have blown the whistle dead. But the way it transpired, and nobody knew when we signed off the air last night, did anyone say, did Ray Ferrero say, whoa, they got away with one? Did, did uh, Craig Simpson No, Everyone was saying, did the puck go in? Oh, yeah, it did go in. Uh, Colorado's up three games to one. What a great story for Nazem Kadri. So the way the game was going and the way the game was called, I wouldn't have called it the way it transpired either. So we can argue that till we're blue in the face. We can argue if we've gone backwards. Um, no crackdown last night. But to me, the team that should have won still won. We should be at 3-1, so at the end of the day, even though we've taken a rocky road to get there, Baskin-Robbins, 
We're still where we should be. 31 flavors, free one athlete. <laughs> Steve Cooley is with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. So what do you make of what Cooper had uh, uh, for us after the game? Was that a matter of being legitimately devastated at a game and, you know, kind of face value or knowing what was to come and the uphill battle looking to try to get any advantage possible going into game five, remembering that maybe they got the short end of the stick on a game winning goal. Yeah, it's probably both. I mean, if, if I know a lot of people take a lot of mulligans when they golf, sometimes even when they're not supposed to, I would have said to John, if I knew you were going to do that, I would have told you not to do it. Um, I would have taken the fine and not showed up. He's supposed to show up, you know, uh, post game presser, uh, regular season, you can give a few to your coaches, assistant, and then you got to be there in the playoffs. So they had too many good things happen, and he's got too good of a reputation to kind of end the way they did there. He could have came right out and said, they had too many men on the ice. I'm really disappointed. I'll talk more tomorrow. I don't think the goal should have counted. Blah, 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 blah. So I have not heard him yet today. So you said he spoke again today. Did he backtrack? Did he double down? Um, but last night, I would have said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Well, it, it does uh, set up a, I mean, a huge opportunity for the Avalanche. I mean, one went away. I mean, that building has been bananas throughout the regular season in the playoffs. I can't imagine what it's going to be Friday night. Um, what do you think the chances are that the Lightning get up off the mat and get this series back to so back to Florida for game six? I think the chances of them winning game number five are about 33%, and it'll have to be a 98% performance by number 88. I, 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 I only see a Tampa win if, honestly, it's a zero, a one, and maybe a two, but then Tampa would have to win in overtime as well. So Vasilevsky better put up something very low, but even if he does, that's like squeezing the crest out of the two. You think there's one more brush left in it, and, and, you, and you got... Even if they do that, the two will be empty for a game six. And if they were to get to a game seven, I, I, I don't see a scenario now where the lightning banged up and without Braden points, power plays not good right now, win the Stanley Cup. Maybe game five, 33%, but the abs are going to win. It's just a matter of when, when, when. Cool. Uh, you've covered Nazem Kadri for a long time. And I mean, his legacy up until now had been stupid decisions in the playoffs that had really cost his team and himself. Um, the OT winner in the cup final to get his team within a game of winning the championship. How might that change uh, Kadri's playoff legacy going forward, considering his heroics last night? I I, I think it's just going to make a... Um, you can change story... Uh, with the cherry on top if they end up winning. It's going to be, see this guy was so good, that was a hothead, that made a mistake, that made a mistake, that made a mistake, and if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Give him another chance, and look what he's done. The fact he said, I'm coming back on that Instagram post despite having a broken finger in surgery, and then scores the overtime winner in game four is something special. Nobody... Nobody would not want to have Nazem Kadri on their team. Uh, let's be honest. That, that was never an issue, um, notwithstanding his mistakes. It, it might be time to move on from a certain team, but he's an elite second-line center. They slot in so nicely, don't they? McKinnon, Kadri, and then JT Comfer. This will make it look like, yeah, you can change, you can learn, and then he'll head off into free agency. Uh, I, I I don't know if he'll ever really be a true number one center. That's never been the case. He was a three at time in Toronto, but he's a perfect number two. And this is going to, it's going to write itself if the Avalanche do win the cup in game five, six or seven. I'm sure his agent was quite happy with uh, what transpired last night, heading into unrestricted free agency. Um, cool. When you look at the Avalanche, let's say that they win this. I mean, if you had to, uh, if you had to vote on a Con Smythe winner right now from Colorado, well, who gets your vote? I think the only real runaway leader is probably Gail McCarr, and it's not crazy. And it, it, I don't think we have a lot of contenders. I mean, if if Tampa's going to win the cup, and we're going to, you know, there's not going to be a losing Consmite winner on Tampa. Vasilevsky would have to go zero, one, zero, and then he would get it. Or Stammer would have to score three overtime goals or Kucherov. I think right now the only player on the board 
is Kale McCarr. I, I feel that way. Unless something really dramatically changes, he's been the most consistent throughout all the series and this series. Nate McKinnon was kind of struggling getting points until he scored off his skate last night. He was playing well, but wasn't finishing. So uh, I think we're in the Kale McCarr club, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I don't think there's a lot of argument. Yeah, I mean, the one guy that we heard more talk about at the beginning of this series was Nichushkin, and I'm with you. I mean, I think it's Kale McCarr and then everybody else. But Nichushkin is such a fascinating, fascinating story. I mean, Cooley, this guy was a first-round selection, 10th overall by Dallas, played 57 games in a season just like four years ago and had zero goals. How does a guy go from that to where he is right now, and what lessons will NHL GMs take from Valerie Nichushkin's emergence with Colorado, considering his disappointing early years in the league. It's got to be a scenario where who's the next Valerie Nichushkin? Who else is out there underachieving? Who else is out there? Remember, you have to have believed in him. He had to be elite a first. Like, you're not going to say, oh, I got a seventh round pick over here. He, I don't think it works like that. It's got to be somebody else that there were great expectations it didn't work for whatever reason, or in Dallas's case, they were too defensive. So maybe there's a team that is too defensive or has a defensive-minded coach that has someone that you think is a diamond in the rough. Is there really another Artemi Panarin out there? People say KHL. Let's go to the KHL. Let's get uh, Kuzmenko, whatever his name is, Vancouver. I don't. I think a Panarin's a one-off. The Nutrition story is probably a one-off. But GMs will look under every rock to see if there's something similar. But you are right, Andrew. It is an unbelievable story, my friend. Hey, uh, Cooley, just bring it back to the Jets for a minute before we break. Uh, we heard Elliot Friedman last night report that Pierre-Luc Dubois is planning on testing unrestricted free agency in 2024. Two years left on his deal, or two years of team control, I guess I should say. Two years left of Mark Shifley under contract. Uh, there'd been plenty of speculation that maybe Shifley would be on the way. And we all know that the Winnipeg Jets traded Patrick Line to get Pierre-Luc Dubois. Um, put the GM hat on right now. I mean, how challenging is maneuvering through these next couple years for Kevin Sheveldayoff and the team here in the peg? It will be, but I don't think he has to go through the pylons just yet. I think he'll have to draw out what Lou Lamorello taught us, the six-month, the 12-month, the 18-month, the two-year, the three-year plan, and be ready to change it uh, at, at, at five seconds notice. So there's time to get the coach, to create a system, to win, go on a bit of a run. Let's just say the Jets do what the Rangers did this year. Then you say to Pierre-Luc Dubois and Mark Shifley, what's going on? Say one stays and signs an extension. The other one's not sure. Then you can decide if there's a trade in the works there. In a perfect world, how wouldn't you want these two guys long-term to be your one and two line centers down the middle for a extended period. I think that's realistic, but if one stays and one goes, then you make sure you get something for them. It will be challenging, but the, the decisions and the pylon maneuvering doesn't have to be made yet. Not quite yet. It will probably in 12 months from now, my friend. Hey, Cooley, last one on the way out. I mean, we'll finish up the cup and then <clears throat> boom, we're right into the draft in Montreal and then into free agency. Uh how busy do you think the draft floor will be trade-wise? And uh, what intrigues you about what's to come in Montreal outside of obviously the players being selected? Well, having been on the floor and doing the show from the floor uh, for Sirius XM, if there's no movement or no hockey trades, then it does drag a little bit. <laughs> God bless the 15th overall pick that most people have never heard of or seen play, but are suddenly experts on the subject. <laughs> that's just a little broadcasting joke for us. Um, it has to have some element of wheeling and dealing. And because it's a bit later and we're getting back on schedule, I hope the GMs have done their due diligence and we do get trades on the floor. I'm holding out hope, but I'm not holding my breath. I mean, hockey trades. I mean, trading Mackenzie Blackwood. I mean, trading William Nylander. I mean, trading Jacob Chikrin. I'd like to see those types of things because we go draft, UFA, and a shorter summer. So get on your horses, GMs, and make these type of trades because the clock is ticking. So give us something exciting, or this could be a long Montreal night. 
Cooley, thanks so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Say hi to Paul Maurice and wish him well for us down in Florida when you talk to him a little later on. And uh, can't wait to hear uh, more of what you and Craig have going on in the Cool Button Podcast. Really enjoying it. Thank you so much, Andrew, Mike, all my friends in Winnipeg. In Barry, we trust. Let's do it on Canada Day, okay? And I'll say hello to Paul for you guys. I promise. Uh, great stuff with Cooley. Love the energy. And of course, you can check him out at Sirius XM NHL Radio. All right. We promised you we'd play a little bit of Paul Maurice's comments from earlier today. A little bit of a, uh, a throwback to all those press conferences here in Winnipeg. We'll do that in just a second. Uh, just before we do that, though, do want to uh, mention that Friday night, Bombers, Thai Cats. Um, the CC will be flowing. Of course, Canadian Club is a proud sponsor of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the official spirit of the club. And you can get your favorite Canadian Club cocktail at the game. And of course, before as well at the Princess Auto Tailgate Party. Now, uh, you can also pick up the drink of the summer, the Ready to Drink Canadian Club and Ginger at, well, your favorite local beer store. But if you pop by the Canadians beer stores this month, with every six pack, you get a free Slim Can Blue Bomber koozie and you'll be entered to win an autographed Blue Bomber jersey. Um, hey, I gotta give a shout out to our friends at Boston Pizza. I met uh, Greg and a couple of the other boys down at Boston Pizza last night for the game. Always great uh, to be watching on the big screen with big sound in the Boston Pizza Lounge. And I uh, had a chance to check out that new summer menu, the Carnitas Pizza, Tacos, pizza flights are back uh, of course you can pop by your local bp tonight and enjoy it all or order online and check out their game day deals over at bostonpizza.com um we've got some congratulations to get out to we've got some winners from our assiniboia downs contest uh first things first we've got five winners you all are going to be invited to join myself and Michael Remus out at the Downs on Tuesday, July 12th. Uh, we're going to uh, be set up in the Terrace Dining Room. We'll be able to, everyone will get a complimentary buffet, the incredible world-famous prime rib buffet at Assiniboia Downs. Really looking forward to it. Uh, congratulations to Scott Miller and Michael Sheldon, who were our winners of the contest they both finished up with two wins each and uh both had big wins last night in uh, along with you remus on uh, on horse number five nice pick on that one you you guided some of the listeners into the winner's circle as it was half in the rapper I, that was my favorite <laughs> uh named horse and i'd seen him have success so i was i also hey i would have won too if i was eligible to play in the contest i did pick race six correctly and two of the six times. Well, the we good thing it. is you are a winner because we'll be hosting our guests there. So consider yourself getting the dub and you will be there. So we had five prizes to give out. Obviously the two people that had the two wins were in. Um, and then we drew a couple spots from other winners and then from everyone that went in and the random draw picked up another one, the person that had one win. So congratulations to Bridget Flynn, Sean Lishka and Paul Saberis, who were the other winners. And uh, they both had a number of entries in and both actually did win a race. So Scott Miller, Michael Sheldon, Bridget Flynn, Sean Lishka, Paul Saberis, book off Tuesday night, July 12th. We'll be hooking up with you, hosting you all at the Terrace Dining Room for a great night of racing. And I do believe they're going to have one of the races that night will be a Winnipeg Sports Talk race. So uh, you'll all be welcome to come down with us. We'll greet the winning horse in the winner's circle, get some pictures. Should be a really, really fun night. Thanks again to Sherry and Darren and the gang at Assiniboia Downs for pulling this off. And uh, we'll look forward to having you out there. So congratulations to everyone, and thanks for playing. Maybe we'll do it again a little bit later on this season. Live racing is back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, of course, you can bet at hpibet.com if you want to hit on some of the other tracks around the world. I was looking at Woodbine this afternoon. Might not might throw a toonie on one of those other races. Uh, of course, you can find out more at asdowns.com. All right. We got to get to the cool bet lines. Um, a little bit more on the Bombers. And don't forget, by the way, if you're with us on YouTube, 
at three o'clock or thereabouts when we finish. Uh, we'll kick you over to DB and Walby, who will be doing their bonfire game day show, getting ready for tomorrow night's game. If you're with us on YouTube, just stick around. And by the way, if I haven't mentioned already, great numbers today in the show. Hit that red subscribe button if you haven't already. Welcome to everyone new that maybe you're just finding out about us as we grow the channel. We're here every day, one o'clock central time on YouTube. Help the boys out. Hit that red subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up as well and join us daily here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, before we finish up and get to the... Uh, well, we do want to hear from what John Cooper had to say. We were just sort of referring that to with uh, Cooley. We do have a clip from, uh, from John Cooper, but I think everyone interested to hear new Panthers head coach Paul Maurice and what he had to say after being pretty quiet for the last six months. Maurice met the media today in Florida. We've got a couple clips First off, here's Maurice Waxen on how he came to sign with the Florida Panthers. Well, one of the things, a little bit of time and some experience in the league um, allows you to do is, is, is assess you know, what your needs are as, as, a, as a father and a family man and also a coach. What do I need in the next process? Because I'm looking to get to the next level too. Right, I, I'm, I'm looking for that final push too. Probably 10 days ago, uh, I have a phone call with Bill and, and that's where the process started. And then I get off the phone and I'm ready. I, I can't explain it to you any better than that. You walk into a room, you talk to a bunch of men, they tell you their plans and they've got them, right? They're, they're, they're working on things. They have a plan if this happens, a plan if this happens, and they're ready to work. And you're going, oh, man, I, I want to be a part of this. So that switch got flipped real fast. And it wasn't from, I'm not coaching anymore. It was, I'm only going to a place that I think I can make a difference and I can be a part of something, a community, a team, a franchise, because I, I want that passion in my life too. I, I want that juice, right? That's what fires you up, gets you to the rink on time and he excels at that. So whatever it is, he pushes my buttons. That, uh, he, he, he figured me out real fast. All right. There, speaking of pushing buttons, um, former Jet coach Paul Maurice pushing all the right buttons. There's nobody that wins the press conference better than Pomo Reem. I mean, he's got everyone in Florida on his side. He, Libel came in. I was ready to turn on my microphone and jump in, and Libel's like, he's here. <laughs> How much he, you know, praised Bill Zito about taking the jump. I'm like, of course he did. And, you know, we had all these comments that were saying, oh, I thought Maurice wasn't considering coaching. I thought he was done. Well, I was like, well, I went over the reasons yesterday. Now I got interrupted when I showed uh, my notes on the screen. But, I mean, you look, you get you go from, you know, n not coaching to a three-year contract, go from Winnipeg to Florida. And we talk about all the benefits of Florida, the weather, the what the tax advantages with stating of tax, the pretty good team of, too. Lack of COVID restrictions. Oh yeah, you go from coaching the best team in the league. So in the regular season, who wouldn't want to do that? But, like this was a the perfect. You couldn't have asked for a better situation for him as head coach. So of course he's gonna come back to coaching. So good. You know, congratulations to him, and I, I wish him all the success. But it's hard. I think it's hard for Jets fans. I saw Nicole in chat um, saying, you know, I'm not sure how to feel. He walked away on the Jets, and you look at the state of the team. It's like like in uh, Batman, what is it, Dark Knight, when the Joker hits the detonator on the hospital and walks away and goes <laughs> like this. Like, you know, I'm not saying he's wearing a nurse costume, but... I mean, we've heard about all the turmoil in the Jets' locker room and how many players want out. I mean, this guy's scooting scoo It was on his play. watch. It was on his watch. Uh, and, it, I mean, listen, there's no doubt that he's like, a big part of what I'm, has been left here. I'm getting flashbacks of the Simpsons when Lyle Landley sells them the monorail and, and bails and the monorail crashes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that just came to me, but... um. I, you know, wish him the best. I mean, he was great. A great work. Great for the first couple of years. Took him to a conference final. I mean, he's taken Carolina to a Stanley Cup as well. But um, I think there's some mixed feelings here for Jets fans. Just you never. How often do you see a coach walk away uh, like he did from a team? 
It's very rare. It was a rare and weird situation here in Winnipeg. The Jets and are moving on, and Paul Br Maurice has Br moved on to the Florida Panthers. And I agree with Brandon when he said, like, the Jets were kind of similar. Offensive team that couldn't play defense. And they couldn't play defense here. I don't know. So I don't know what the fit is, but... He's got a lot of got a lot of experience and he has had success. So well, he's certainly charmed the people in Florida and obviously said the right things to ownership. Here's one more clip from Paul Maurice, who I uh, was asked about being burned out last year and walking away. I critique my own performance. So most nights in the NHL, if you walked off the bench and the team lost a game, I'm not looking at the player's performance. What did I do that day? Um, that I missed, missed something. I always feel like if you don't win, you miss something. Now you, you're not going 82 and 0s, but so I judge my own performance. And some of it is at times can be a perceived lack of efficacy at times. So you push hard, you push hard, push hard, and you get this big return the first time you push that button. And every time you push that button, there's slightly less return, right? It's a little harder to drive it. And I know, even though, God, those players never quit. They, they, they worked hard right till the end. I know that I wasn't producing at a level that I expect myself to produce. I expect myself to have an impact in the room and to be able to change things and push things. Um, and, and I didn't feel I was having that effect. So on my own job performance, so that's where my love of the game comes, come in and, and drive a group, right? Like be a part of it. And I do, I love this game. But if you're coming to the rink now and you're not feeling that you're driving the group in a manner, you're not performing the way you need to perform, the part of this is experience. I know when they need a, a change. Unless you're winning Stanley Cups or driving right to that edge all the time, I think the coach's window is about six years. All right, there is just a, a bit of, uh, you know, a longer answer from Paul Murray speaking. Uh, I know people would be interested to hear a little bit more about what happened here in Winnipeg. Um, I'm sure he'll be making the rounds, doing a number of interviews over the next little while. But moving forward, it'll be all eyes on the Florida Panthers. And the one thing I will say, Remo, and sort of the reason why I brought this up with Brandon, he does have the three-year contract. But I really think that the expectations are immediate on Paul Maurice. And it will be really interesting to see how things work out in South Florida. Cause that's one hell of a hockey team. Um, he's got a number one center in Alex Barkov, which is one of the best two way centers in the game. I don't think anyone will doubt that they've got the personnel there to challenge for a Stanley cup. Now it'll be on Maurice to get them over to the top to, you know, the one prize that he has never won. And that is getting his name on uh, the Holy grail. I mean, they just fired the Jack Adams, Trophy winner. I mean, if that doesn't get you a job. Well, he didn't win. Nominee. Sorry, sorry. Nominee. You got Darryl nominated. Won it. One of three. The best coach in the NHL got nominated for that season. And he did not get a job. So, yeah, the expectations are, are pretty high. And I did, sorry, I mentioned all the reasons for Paul Maurice to want to go to Florida. Of course, how could I forget time zones? Yes, they're going to be staying. All the teams in their division are in the same time zone. Eastern, all time zones. So, uh Big benefit there. No travel. You know what? Even with Maurice gone, we're still banning the time zone conversation on this program. It no. is what it is. We live in Winnipeg. We're in the central time zone. Going to have to deal with that because that is never changing <laughs> as long as the Jets are in the National Hockey League. Hey, um, moving on to last night's game. We'll get to the cool bet lines. Of course, we've got a CFL game tonight to kick off the week. Um, I think everyone pretty much heard what John Hooper had to say after the game last night. Um uh, he didn't come right out and say it. Everyone's wondering, what's he talking about? And then we all got hearing and watching the replays of the game with the too many men. Cooper did say that he would speak today. And uh, here's a little bit of what the Tampa Bay Lightning head coach had to say, facing elimination, heading to Denver for game five. So <laughs> it's it's funny because, you you know, you're an emotional game and, and I... Um, you know, I found it odd that they got that wide open in the, in the play, but there's nothing you can really, you know, from our angle on the bench and the reviewing, like whether the puck's in the net. So the only way I can find out is I have to go back in the room and, and, and look at the tape. So um, you do, and then you have to f face all of you five minutes after an emotional loss. And so I apologize, you know, for last night um, because that's what you get when you have to speak to the media right away um i don't know i it's uh what's great about today is that it's not yesterday and 
now it's it's uh, like I'm, you know, got some excitement for uh, for game five, and and that's where like now my mind's turning on how to win that. Nothing I can we can do to turn back. They missed it. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's uh, water under the bridge now. Let's uh, let's go get ready for uh, should be a hell of a game five. All right, so there is John Cooper, the Tampa Bay Lightning, moving on after a very disappointing and somewhat controversial end to the game last night. But as you heard from Steve Coolius, and this is the one thing, Rio, I wonder whether things will be at all different in game five. They didn't call a damn thing last night for the better part of the second half of that hockey game. And, um, I mean, it opens up for a controversial goal like that. And the funniest thing about last night's game was they actually had six skaters listed as on the ice on the freaking game sheet at the end of the game. Although that has been changed, I think, just to avoid embarrassment for the National Hockey League today. Yeah, I was um, so mad after the game with his cryptic comments. He started, like, eulogizing the season. I was like, what do you mean? the game? It's not over. And then he's like, you guys will see. And... You know, I was so, and I went, now gonna wait till tomorrow and like figure out what he's just tell us what you mean. Just tell us. And you're seeing that so much this playoffs that coaches are finding creative ways to trash the officiating without actually saying this ref sucked. Someone will ask a question about the officiating. They're like, well, you saw it out there. They're like, well, if you're asking me, you probably knew the answer. And they always give answers like that. Some coach come out and just trash the officiating if you really want to. I agree. They call nothing. There are no penalties. There's hits from behind, holds. They call nothing. And you you think that was the only time in that game where a guy jumped on the ice early. And it was pretty clear it was too many men. If McKinnon's the guy coming off and Kadri's coming on and touching the puck, that is too many men. But look, they didn't call it. It's not reviewable. What do you want to do? And I don't want to open the can of worms on too many men reviews. Horrible, more reviews, horrible idea. We don't want that. So, look, you win some, you lose some. Last year, Tampa won one with seven guys on the ice <laughs> against, against, uh... Karma's a bitch, John. Islanders. <laughs> I mean, whatever. It was great, first of all, that Lekkanen pass to Kadri in, si uh, in stride with beautiful Kemper playing the ball. Colorado was dominant. They're deserving. I was so mad. And, but hey, that John Cooper is doing a good job, I guess, if he's getting this reaction out of me. Hey, yeah, no doubt. Lots of lobbying right now, and we'll see what's up. And listen, it's been different every game uh, as the series has gone on. I mean, I still think about that penalty they gave to Sorelli uh, for tripping to set up a five on three in game one. That happened far more egregiously half a dozen times yesterday in the game, and nobody got called. And, you know, it's just an unfortunate thing about the game that the standard changes so much um you know from game to game series to series uh, certainly from the regular season to the playoffs all right let's get to the uh cool bet lines just checking the series numbers right now on colorado hey if you think if you're like for wiki that thinks that tampa might be able to win this game and if they can still come back and win the series tampa is nine to one right now to win the series they're plus 900 avalanche obviously a heavy favorite at minus four 1429 for the game uh tomorrow night tampa right now plus 150 underdog colorado minus 179 to win it finish it and raise the stanley cup tomorrow all right let's get to the cfl because we do have a game tonight it's the saskatchewan rough riders and the montreal alouettes and after getting up to three yesterday I was kind of thinking that we might get to three and a half. Well, no, it's gone the other way. Alouettes plus two and a half tonight uh, at home is the home underdog. And the Riders minus two and a half favorites. Riders minus 137 on the money line. And the Alouettes plus 115. As far as tomorrow's Bomber Ticats game go, the game opened at five. It's now four and a half for the Bombers. So Bombers four and a half point favorites tomorrow. Ticats four and a half point dogs. Bombers minus 217 on the money line. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats plus 175. Other games, Saturday, doubleheader. Edmonton, Calgary in Cowtown. Calgary, eight and a half point favorites. And the BC Lions, five point favorites against the Toronto Argonauts. Uh, we'll be uh, chopping these up with Dustin Nielsen tomorrow on the lock shop before Winnipeg Sports Talk. Make sure to check our Twitter feeds for that. 
And uh, Dusty's also, I think, going to pop by and join us live at Little Brown Jug for the beginning of the show tomorrow. He'll, of course, be in Winnipeg coming in tonight to call tomorrow's game on TSN. Uh, oh, an NBA draft tonight as well. We hit this on the lock shop earlier. Uh, let's see if we still got this number for the first overall pick or whether that one's off the board. Uh, first overall pick, Jabari Smith. Oh, this is good news. Got him at minus 115 on the lock shop on Tuesday. It's now minus 303. Paolo Banchero plus 175. And Chet Holmgren, uh, the other guy in the mix, I guess, at plus 25, uh, 25 to 1. If you are a draft nick or uh, just want to get a little action on the draft tonight, hit cool bet. Tons of options to bet on the NBA draft tonight. Um, my God, Remo, what a gorgeous afternoon. Might be time to get outside. A little windy, but uh, high of 31 degrees. Hopefully the weather can hold off and give us a gorgeous day for tomorrow. That is somewhat in question right now. Uh, but the bottom line is a uh, great show today. Great turnout tomorrow. Looks like it's going to be 29 degrees. Maybe a chance of some showers or thunder showers. Uh, but needless to say, another great summer day. Great temperature for getting out and enjoying both the uh, Princess Auto pregame tailgate party and uh, everything going on at IG Field tomorrow night for that game. Following, of course, our show at Little Brown Jug in the afternoon with everyone invited. Yeah, great night for a game tomorrow. Uh, yes, yeah, CFL kicks off tonight. I'm looking forward to that. Also be doing a lot of preparations. Make sure everything works. You've never done an on-location show. <laughs> I think we're ready. I think I have all the... Equipment, I've been so on location before, but having us both no. in the same spot, Remo controlling has not happened. It's so, very, uh, di it's very different. Very different. One thing I can guarantee: the beer will be delicious, and it will be cold, and it'll all be there at Little Brown Jug. So pop down and join us tomorrow. We'd love to see you for that. Dave Asplin in the chat mentions: set your DK lineups. Damn right, I just got in under the wire. We've got 39 people right now for the CFL contest. So if you do want to play with us for this week's CFL draft Kings contest, go to the Winnipeg sports talk league. The contest is up. Uh, we can get up to 50 people in, but uh, it'll be resized. So uh, last call for Winnipeg sports talk draft Kings contest, $3 top five win. Always a fun way to uh, add a little bit more to the weekend. Um, all right. So tomorrow, Pop by, join us at Little Brown Jug. We will have a, couple, a pair of bomber tickets to give away. Uh, we'll try and maybe get into the tickle trunk and have a few other things. And as I said, uh, the best opportunity for the really the first time as we've been doing this to get people together and take the show on the road. Hopefully one of many, but it should be a great first time. And what a great place to do it down at Little Brown Jug in the exchange. Don't forget, folks, hit that red subscribe button. Make sure you're joining us daily here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Do a favor, do us a favor, tell a friend about us. Still is funny how more and more people are finding out what we're doing here each and every day. And a shout out to everyone listening on the podcast. If you do have the opportunity to get to Apple or Spotify, give us a five-star rating and a little review. Certainly helps us grow the channel as well. Man, this has been fun. So great to have Matt Libel back on the program. Coolius is one of our favorites. And obviously, Brandon always brings it when he's on the program. And no shortage of topics to get to today. Tomorrow, it's game day. Dustin Nielsen's going to be calling the game on TSN. He will join us. Murata Tesh as well. And Mike McIntyre is going to join us live. Live at Little Brown Jug as well and kick it in the last half hour of the program. Fingers crossed we will be able to execute the marble race on location. We'll see how that goes. But the bottom line is I know it's going to be a lot of fun. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys in person. Pop by and see us tomorrow live at Little Brown Jug. And if you can't make it, just make sure you're joining us live on YouTube at 1 o'clock as usual right here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Thanks to you for making us a part of your day. We'll see you tomorrow either here on YouTube or live at Little Brown Jug. And, of course, big game day tomorrow. We'll be all over it. Bombers, tie Cats, and the latest Jets and NHL news right here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Oh, my God. Oh! Oh! Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.